What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Faith Unaltered. This is like our fourth or fifth live stream that we've been creating, producing, going live this week. And so welcome. This is part two of Killing Calvinism. And as you can see, we've got a whole host of people that have investigated the subject and have been very good, I think, at the title, offering different kinds of arguments. Again, I want to say this before we even get into it. We're talking about the ism, not the ist tonight. And so if you have not seen part one, check that out. We had Dr. Layton Flowers, Jordan Hatfield, and Lucas Curcio on. Uh, and I thought it went extremely well. Josh seemed to be very pleased with it. We've gotten a lot of good feedback, obviously some not so good feedback, but that's to be expected whenever doing a topic like this, right? Like will knows all about right. negative feedback. So <laughs> I'm just playing, but anyway, guys, thank you for joining me. I am actually not going to be sticking around it is way past my bedtime and I'm seepy. And so I'm going to go to bed after this introduction, but I just wanted to come on here and say, Hi to everybody that I support and that I'm friends with, and I love you guys. And so thank you all for doing this. This is this is awesome. This, I think this is going to be a really good thing uh, once it gets out and about. So thank you guys. And Josh, I'll turn it over to you, brother. Right on. Well, I appreciate you coming on to to do the, uh, the opening there and then help me out with some of the tech for a second. But gotcha. yeah, like Tyler said, uh, our intent tonight is to discuss Calvinism, not Calvinists. Right. Uh, that distinction, I think, needs to be made more clearly. Uh, it seems like there's a little bit of uh, back and forth confusion going on in the uh, let's call it digital space about uh, how we can address these things without being um, unduly divisive. And uh, to me, I say not all ideas are created equal, even if all peoples are. And so it's worth making that distinction. It's worth noting. I don't think we have to do 35 minutes of it like they did on part one with our their Man. jabber john, but I think we're good. I think that was sufficient. And if anybody wants to, you can go back to that part one and listen to that first 35 minutes and get the full form version of our distinction here that Tyler and them laid out really nicely. It was beautiful. Um, but as for, as for tonight, what we're going to try to do is offer our best understanding of the the most powerful objections we've encountered to try to knock down the ism, Calvinism, right? Um, this, this particular view. And so with that being said, I'll introduce the first one here to my, uh, on the screen, my right, which is Tim, uh, Dr. Stratton from Free Thinking Ministries. Welcome back. It's good to see you, man. Uh, thanks, Josh and Tyler. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm honored to be on this panel with, uh, some guys that I really look up to, all of you, actually. So thanks for this uh, opportunity. Right on. And uh, joining us again for the second time in, I guess, seven days, probably right, is Warren uh, McGrew. Welcome back. Um, this thing's, I think, the only the second time I've ever gotten to be on a stream with you. So it's kind of cool to interact again. Oh, dude, uh, welcome yeah. back. Well, it's good to see you. Good seeing you. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back. I love everybody on the screen and um yeah it's 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 a fun time and looking forward to it right on and of course we have with us uh both of the guys from church split this time we have will and joining us for the first time is brian also it's nice to have both halves uh that's really cool so welcome fellas thank you kind sir happy to be here um this has been a while since i've been on and so it's really cool to be on with uh warren and all the other guys because it's been too long since we've all interacted so i'm looking forward to getting in yeah definitely thanks for having us on this is exciting uh tim warren glad to have you guys here too and tyler and josh thanks a lot for the invite absolutely brother right on. well we appreciate your willingness to come on and uh uh it's 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 always nice to meet new faces for sure like i i as somebody who actually likes people, which I've met a lot of people who don't like people. So for me, that's <laughs> it's always odd, but I genuinely like people. And so it's always nice to meet new faces and, and interact this way. So I'm already happy about it, you know, um, but we have a lot of cool, shining faces here. And um, I, I guess let's let's dive in. Um, is there. Well, let me let me ask, has everybody here seen the first part? Did we are we all caught up on what was said in the first one? Bro, Migo, that was three hours, and <laughs> right. I had a busy weekend. No Nobody doubt. watched it. <laughs> oh, I started. I had it on. 
I saw I had it on. I saw probably that. 45 minutes of it. Probably 45 minutes of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw some it. A for well, effort. I listened to it. So yeah, I did that. too. <laughs> Uh, hey. All right, fair enough. Well, I was going to ask if anybody wanted to wanted to try to to drop in anything that they they heard on the first one that they wanted to clarify on uh, that they they heard some of the arguments from before um, if they enjoyed that. But since nobody since nobody's caught up with that, I mean, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'll just say I'll just say this, Josh. I mean, uh, you invited a whole bunch of people people to be a part of this, and all of us said we can't do Saturday. So of course we we're going to have a hard time watching it as well. Yeah, right. and then Sundays, I'm in oh, ministry, same. and Sundays are wildly busy uh, days for me, and so I did not get around to it, and now today's Monday. It's on the queue, just haven't gotten yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, I guess since we uh, since we have a, a pretty good size round table here, I guess let's just kind of go around the table. Um, I know that, Tim, you have something prepared. If you want to kick us off with uh, with what you have prepared, that'll give us a good mouthpiece to start off with with uh because i know that you have a couple of thoughts that are already really great and and well organized so uh that'll give us a good starting place well cool i think the first thing uh that i i've got to mention is i didn't come up with this nickname uh the buff molinist who tyler was that you (laughs) (laughs) i changed everybody's name i was seeing how long it took y'all to notice yeah i I noticed that it's about the same time tim did i was like wait a minute something (laughs) (laughs) what I don't, yeah, I, 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 you are the buff Molinist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just you know, William let, you know. Craig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I guess I'll. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Um, oh man. Sorry. So I'll I'll talk about this a uh, little bit. I, I'm not a Calvinist for for multiple reasons. But I used to be a Calvinist. I was a, a Calvinist preaching pastor uh, for several years. Um, I was a youth pastor, um, but I, I taught Calvinism uh, to my youth group uh, for for a long time. And not only did I teach Calvinism, I taught uh, determinism. I taught that God that God determines everything. Uh, so I sincerely believe that you know when I drop my pencil. God determined me to drop my pencil. Uh, when I would sin, God determined me to sin. Sometimes I'd get so mad at him and I, I, or, you know, maybe not mad, but I'm like, God, please stop making me sin. <laughs> you know, um, why, why are you doing this to me? Uh, I used to be an MMA fighter. I remember I, I lost a fight that I was, I should have won. And I was like, God, uh, why did you make me lose? Um, and, uh, you know, all, all of these, uh, things, I was always, uh, viewing everything through the lens of Calvinistic determinism. Um, and I even prayed that way. When I would pray for my lost friends, I would uh, ask God to determine them to be Christians. Um, then it hit me once that I realized, well, God's already um, predetermined uh, before the foundations of the world if they would be uh, Christians or not. So I would actually stopped praying. Um you know, this is all while I was a pastor going through all of this, but I tried to be consistent. Um, but that that commitment to consistency is what ultimately made me realize that Calvinism has to be false. So I've offered multiple arguments against uh, Calvinism. Um, there's one that I call the deity of deception argument. Uh, you can find that uh, in my book called Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge, and Mere Molinism. And I will say, even if you're not a, a Molinist, guys like uh, my friend Warren here, um, you can find, you'll like most of the book because I'm really arguing against, much of it is arguing against this uh, divine determinism. Um, but uh, there's really one of the, I'd say probably the biggest reason why I'm no longer a Calvinist um, is is because it's got a low view of God, a low view of a lot of things. So it's, it's, uh, Low view of five things that I think are pretty important that we ought to think of differently. So today I'm going to argue that Calvinism is false because it has a low view of God, a low view of the Bible, a low view of man, a low view of sin. I can unpack that. And finally, a low view of the gospel. And that is to say that I I contend that Calvinism, understood as the view that God 
um, that God's sovereignty is explained by exhaustive divine determinism, or what I uh, describe as EDD or ED, exhaustive divine determinism. Um, that view promotes the following incorrect theological view. So let's, I'm not going to go through all five right now. I'm going to give two. And then if there's time, uh, after everybody's talked and you want to hear more, I can unpack it. But let me give the top two. Um, the low view of God and low view of God's word. So in the book, The Knowledge of the Holy, uh, A.W. Tozer uh, says that what, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I totally agree with that. Uh, in, in the preface of the same book, uh, he says, let me read this. He says, quote, the church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted for it one so low, so ignoble as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. The low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us, end quote. And so amen to that. Totally agree with Tozer. Now, according to this exhaustive divine deterministic view advanced by Calvinists, uh, God is literally a deity of deception and thus an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs. So let me, let me quickly fly over what I've explained at length elsewhere on my YouTube channel, Free Thinking Ministries. Uh, and uh, in my uh, my website, freethinkingministries.com or freethinkinc, that's freethinkinc.org. So if you want more on this stuff, go there or to the YouTube channel. But here's the deal. No theologian, um, I, I don't know of any single theologian who guarantees that they possess a perfect set of theological beliefs. In fact, in my debate with uh, Dr. James White, uh, two years ago this month in Houston, you know, Dr. White uh, is really probably one of the most confident theologians uh, the world has ever seen. Um, and, and But he admitted to me during our debate that he did not have perfect theology. Now, I'm glad he was honest. But here's the thing. If we know that we get some things wrong here and there, well, then when you're asked, well, which beliefs that you affirm are false? Well, you don't know. You think like everything you believe. Uh, I mean, every uh, every every uh, theological belief that you affirm, you think is true. But you know, you've got to be making some mistakes somewhere. Um, nobody claims to be, you know, uh, infallible. Well, maybe the Pope does, but <laughs> uh, when he speaks from the chair, I don't know. But but uh, you know, no, no, I don't think anybody is infallible. Uh, theologically. So here's the rub. If no Christ follower who studies God's word has a perfect set of theological beliefs, then this means that all Christ followers who study God's word possess at least one false theological belief, if not multitudes of false theological beliefs. So these are false theological beliefs that they incorrectly think are true and objectively justified. Uh, that, that is, they're not aware of the defeaters um, or have not recognized the power of certain defeaters to what they subjectively consider to be good justification. So this is, get, gets us into some epistemology here. But exhaustive divine determinism, or if exhaustive divine determinism is true, and God determines all things about humanity, then it follows that God intentionally uses his power to cause uh, determine and necessitate his own followers to read scripture, interpret it incorrectly, and then affirm false theological beliefs, all while proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. So if this is the case, then at best, uh, God is an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs. And at worst, I think it's fair to say that on this view, he would be accurately described as a deity of deception. Now, now I'm so I've received some pushback from some well-known Calvinists, uh, one philosopher who's a Calvinist, and he said, yeah, but God has morally sufficient reasons. And I'm saying, okay, well, even if God has morally sufficient reasons to be a deity of deception, he's still a deity of deception. So even if God has great reasons to, 
to deceive all of his loyal followers. The problem is that all of his followers are still deceived, at least in, in some uh, regarding some theological uh, issues and topics. And, and then they stand in no position to know which of their theological beliefs are true and which of their theological beliefs that they believe are true are actually false. And this provides reason to doubt all of their theological beliefs. It's called an undercutting defeater. Um, so consider what I refer to as the deity of deception argument. It's five steps. Um, it goes like this. Premise one, if exhaustive divine determin or, uh, determinism or ed is true, God determines all Christ followers to affirm false theological beliefs. Two, if God determines all Christ followers to affirm false theological beliefs, then God is a deity of deception. Three, God is not a deity of deception. Four, therefore, God does not determine all Christ followers to affirm false theological beliefs. And five, therefore, Ed is false. Exhaustive divine determinism is false. God does not determine all things. Now, if a Calvinist is going to dig in their heels at this point and continue to affirm that God determines all things, not only are they tacitly affirming that God is a deity of deception, but they also are going to have another huge problem on their hands. And this Calvinistic view of divine determinism then leads to a low view of God's word. And that's the second thing I'm going to uh, focus on here. And uh, then I'm not going to go through all five. I'm going to stop with this one. So let's talk about a low view of God's word. Not only does Calvinism not make sense of certain biblical passages, uh, making it clear that humans possess libertarian freedom, uh, I would point to uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, just to get you started. I've written quite a bit on that. But based on what I refer to as the transfer of trust principle, if God is an untrustworthy or reliable source of theological beliefs, then why should we trust a book authored and inspired uh, by this deity of deception, right? I mean, if, if God is an untrustworthy source of theological beliefs, well then, so is a book he inspired that is full of theological beliefs. Now, think about any theological belief a Calvinist who affirms exhaustive divine determinism previously thought was biblically inferred. Well, now, with the transfer of trust principle in mind, one can see that this previously affirmed theological belief itself is not justified. So consider this a defeater. Right. This this is what epistemologists uh, uh, think about. They look at justification and defeaters. Um, if there's a defeater against what you previously thought was justification, now you no longer have justification. And therefore, if you don't have justification, you don't have knowledge. So if that's the case, you don't have n knowledge of uh, you, you don't have theological knowledge. And if that's the case, so much for assurance of salvation. Calvinists love to talk about how they have assurance of salvation. No, you don't. Not on. Not if God is a deity of deception, right? You don't. So much for assurance of salvation or any other theological belief derived from the Bible. So this low view of God, that God is a deity of deception, leads to a low view of Scripture, and it destroys theological knowledge, and that's a huge problem. So, so uh, this Calvinistic view entails a low view of God and a low view of God's word. And that argument I just gave, I, I'm now going to tweak it ever so slightly. And uh, here, here it is. I go like this. Premise one. If Ed is true, God determines all Christ followers to affirm false theological beliefs. Two. If God determines all Christ followers to affirm false theological beliefs, then God is a deity of deception and his inspired word cannot be trusted. Three. God is not a deity of deception and his inspired word can be trusted. Four, therefore, God does not determine all Christ followers to affirm false theological beliefs. And five, therefore, Ed is false. That is, God does not determine all things. So if a Calvinist continues to dig in their heels and assert that God determines all things, which, by the way, is nowhere found in Scripture. There's no verse that says God determines all things, right? Uh, so if they they dig in their heels and assert that God determines everything, then they, rele they relegate God from a maximally great being into a deity of deception, while simultaneously destroying the trustworthiness of the Bible. 
So Calvinism destroys the reliability of Scripture, uh, which they claim is the foundation for Calvinism, and theological and biblical knowledge then just evaporates. Calvinistic determinism is self-defeating. Now, this leads to three more problems, a low view of the Imago Dei, you know, man in God's image, a low view of what it means to sin, and a low view of the gospel. However, I've talked long enough. I'm content with resting my case, at least for the moment. So uh, I give the floor to the rest of the guys. Right on. I appreciate it. Like I, like I was saying before we hopped on live, uh, I appreciate how well organized you always are. It's very professional. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, as far as the the what you've laid out so far, I I actually can't think of anything that I disagree with out of anything you said, but it's really interesting that one of the other arguments that you had prepared, but you didn't bring up was the low view of man and the image of God. That's the yeah. one that, that hits home for me. That's mm -hmm. the one that lands for me. Yeah. But as far as what you said, I have an exceedingly high view of scripture as well. And so I, I, I'm of the, the, the mind that if I can, if I can express to someone the trustworthiness of God, the scripture is 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 brought in with it. Yeah. And so I, I see the flow of what you're talking about exactly. And I work with people who are in a position where they do not trust anyone anymore, including themselves. I work at a rehab facility and a homeless shelter. And the people that I encounter like daily, they they've they've let's say they've they've lived in betrayal so long that they don't have any other expectation. Yeah. You know, and so when they finally meet somebody who has a high view of God and a real authenticity, um, they, they're they just immediately drawn to that, but it makes them afraid at the same time because trust is very expensive, you know? Yeah. And so if you mm -hmm. can't trust, if you can't trust God, you can't trust you, you can't trust anyone else, you're left in a really, really dark spot. That is just unlivable. That's so I'm right. on board. I think that's a knockdown yeah. argument, man. Now, I like, how, what did you say? Trust is expensive. Is that what you said? Trust yeah. is very yes. Trust is very costly, right? And and and, it, and we can't. I mean, this view, this Calvinistic view, uh, puts God in a position where uh, his trust has been damaged, right? We cannot trust him to to determine us to hold true theological beliefs. In fact, on that view, we can trust him to determine every one of us to get things wrong about theology. And, and ultimate reality. Um, that's what we are left with, trusting that God will determine us to all get things wrong. Um, and man, if, if that's what we're going to say, that if that's who God is and the same God that inspired the Bible, then there's no reason to trust anything you read in the Bible. And so if Calvinism is based upon scripture, it's also defeated by that, by that view. Um, and so Fortunately, I mean, we all here can argue that it's not based upon Scripture. It's based on a horrible uh, interpretation of Scripture. Um, but we also have other reasons to reject it, it because it's if, if Calvinism or if God is a deity of deception and he inspires Scripture, then you have reason to doubt Scripture. And if Calvinism is based on Scripture, then you have reason to doubt Calvinism. The whole thing crumbles and it's it's self-defeating to affirm that view so well what say you gents well i had a question for tim i don't know if you've get gotten this a lot when you brought up especially the the god being a god of deception and calvinism because he's given you wrong theology does anyone ever bring up first kings 22 to you where the the lion spirits are sent to the prophets of ahab mm -hmm. to essentially yep. entice him what well, what's your typical reaction to that argument? Yeah. So every everything we see in scripture, uh in the old testament and even in the new, uh there are times that where God allows people to be deceived. Um uh but that is also or always in conjunction with um punishment for rejecting God, rejecting the truth. Um, we see nowhere in Scripture where somebody is an active follower of, of Christ and uh, God just determines him to start thinking incorrectly. Um, in fact, in Romans, we see they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And so what we see is God saying, oh, okay, look, he continues to try to give them truth and they keep exchanging truth 
the truth of God for a lie. And finally, God's like, all right, have it your way. You want to believe lies? Here you go. Um, but but on this view, I've carefully worded it uh, such that I'm not saying God never uh, allows somebody to be deceived. I'm not doing that. I'm saying uh, if if Calvinism is true or if exhaustive divine determinism is true, then God determines every one of his loyal Christ, every lo loyal Christ follower to get things wrong. So that's who I'm focused on. I'm not focused on non uh, on non Christians. I'm not focused on those who are re uh, exchanging the truth of God for a lie. I'm not focused on them. I'm looking at people who are actively uh, in a love relationship, or at least think they are, <laughs> with God. Uh, with them, and, and so it's it's unlivable. Um, as soon as you as some, somebody says, "No, I am an active follower of Christ," well, then they've also got to say, "And God determines me to get theology wrong." And think I'm right. And Brian and I, we kind of investigated that passage a while ago. And one of the things that, of course, it depends on your Old Testament worldview, too. But I take the divine counsel worldview. I am a Heiserite in that area. <laughs> um, but actually, uh, all of Heiser, like, have a trilogy of books right behind me um, that I just haven't I'll, picked up. I was going to throw it to you, Will, and just say, don't you want to give the Dr. Heiser response to this? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I can't, but it, but one of the things that's interesting, one is that it's not, it depends what you mean by like setting a lying spirit as well. This would be somebody kind of doing his job to purposely like at this point do a judge like, in, a, in, a, in a way it'd be like the judicial hardening view. Like God didn't deceive the Jewish people, but there was a judicial hardening knowing the fact that they're going to do this. So therefore he let them go on their own way. And what's funny is that in that same passage, it's like they warn the people that you're doing the wrong thing. Like you're believing the wrong thing. If you keep doing this, there will be this that happens. Yeah. Is it really a lying spirit if right. you're told that you're going to be like led into a lie if you keep doing what you're doing? It's not really a lying spirit at that point. You were warned that this was going to happen. You kept just choosing down your hardened heart road. So sometimes that's part of the problem, uh, which we'll get to when I talk uh, about my issues, but reading the scripture with Western eyes, one of my biggest pet peeves just in general. Yeah, well said. Well, I think too, what you said, Tim, about, you know, uh, assurance of salvation, and you have this idea of, of a God that is giving deceiving thoughts, and you have this problem in Calvinism with apostates. And mm. there's no good way in a Calvinism to explain apostates because you have people that are Calvinists or Christians in general that believe that they are saved. They're showing fruits of the spirit. They're acting well within the Christian body. And then at some point in time, they fall away. Now, sometimes it's a utter destruction fall away. Like you can just see their life crumbling around them. Sometimes it's just like, nope, I got convinced that God's not real and I've walked away. The Calvinist asks that really only has two ways to explain that. Either they were never saved in the first place or they're still saved. And John Calvin has this idea that's been coined. I don't know if he actually said it, but evidence and grace was this idea that God actually gives a deception, a partial grace, an ability to yeah. know some of the truths of God, appear like a Christian, maybe have some questions that maybe real Christians don't have, but eventually um, that grace is removed and you re revert back to your still depraved, but more depraved state that still has no ability to, to respond to the gospel. And now that's essentially something that's you've been judged by. You've been given just a little bit of grace just to be able to judge you more accurately, um, for the destination you were already predestined to go to. Um, and I think that really just, that idea kind of couples both of your two ideas yeah. together. Yeah. And I'd say not just predestined, but determined mm -hmm. and, th and those are two different things i argue uh um yeah the the biggest problem here is are is god determining you to do that so determinism um but uh, you know we have uh, uh philosophically precise definitions here so off the top of my head uh, an event is determined if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate said event and so if we're talking about all things about humanity being determined by god then god provides the antecedent conditions which are sufficient to necessitate everything that goes on in my mind the entirety of my mental activity the entirety of my body movements everything 
exhaustively is determined by God. And a lot of Calvinists try to get around that by saying, well, no, yeah, I can still have guidance control. Wait. And I said, wait a second. What are you got? What do you have the active power to guide if God is determining the entirety of your mental activity? And if somebody says, well, okay, well, uh, I, I have the power to guide that. Well, then say goodbye. You're, then you're not affirming exhaustive divine determinism anymore. Uh, you've just given me a flicker of libertarian freedom. And so on that view, Ed is false. Um, but the consistent Calvinist will say, no, God determines everything, including the entirety of my mental activity. And I say, if, if, if someone else is in control of everything about your mind, you are in control of nothing in your mind. Actually, I think I just quoted uh, Joshua Rasmussen <laughs> um, <laughs> without thinking about it. I think he says something very similar. In fact, he goes on in his book and says something along these lines. He says, something or someone else is determining everything in your mind. You are in control of nothing in your mind, and thus you are a puppet. And uh, people try to get around that by saying, oh, no, but see, puppets, they, they don't have intentional states of consciousness. Like, no, you're missing the point. A puppet is something that is completely determined by someone else. And on Calvinistic determinism, you are completely determined by someone else. Everything about you, the entirety of your mental activity and the entirety of your body movements is determined by antecedent conditions, and that's God. So anyway, it's a it's a self-defeating view. It destroys uh, your trust in God, it des destroys uh, the reliability of Scripture, and you lose the assurance of salvation. In my debate with James White, I, I said, if a, if a God of mischief or a deity of deception assures you of salvation, do you really have? assurance of salvation? And of course, he didn't answer the question, but uh, I'd like to hear somebody answer that question. <laughs> I'd like to hear a Calvinist answer that question. So anyway. Right on. Um, is there anything, uh, is there anything that you guys wanted to add to these two arguments specifically uh, before we move on to anything else? I'm sure you guys all have uh, unique perspectives on which part of Calvinism stands out to you most profoundly as the reason that you would reject it. Like I was saying that the 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 image of God um, is is the thing that stands out to me. But, but I don't want to like hop off of that if if we still have something relevant to go over with uh, with his answers too. I've been a fan uh, of the free thinking uh, argument since I knew of Tim Stratton's ministry um, ages ago. Uh, but I used it to argue against atheism a lot. Mm -hmm. And then once I got into soteriological discussions, I was like, ooh, this is a double-edged sword. This cuts both ways. Yeah. And then you developed the deity of deception argument. And it was just funny because, like, I kind of already, like, morphed it into something like that. Uh, and then you just taken off with that. So now I just use both. It's great. <laughs> I just I very much I very much enjoy it. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, it started with the free thinking argument. And I was using that to argue against uh, naturalism, what I now uh, uh, am more precise with and say it's a robust naturalism that going after this idea that there is no God, there is no things like God. There's, uh, you know, this, this, yes, I mean, really the most popular view of atheism. And now even recently I'm saying, hey, we can really adjust this and fine tune it to go after not just naturalism, but to go after atheism itself. But yeah, this it, it amazed me that when I first started advancing the free thinking argument, most of the pushback I was getting uh, wasn't from atheists. In fact, a lot of them were seemingly, you know, some of them were saying, dude, man, that's a, that's a good argument. I got to think about that one for a while. But the, the most vicious attacks that I received were from fellow Christians, uh, from the Calvinist group who I had just recently left, but I sure wasn't expecting this uh this kind of attack um and and so yeah i found it so weird that christians when we we have a, a, an argument that uh, shows that um epistemic responsibility is, is destroyed on, on naturalism and uh and that this points to um the god of scripture that you would get attacked for advancing that view uh and so because i was attacked so much by it I uh, shifted gears, so to speak, and said, okay, I can adjust this argument to go after divine determinism. And so that's what I did. And I, I like to say, hey, if I wasn't constantly attacked by 
Calvinists, my fellow brothers in Christ, I wasn't attacked by them so much. I wouldn't be developing these arguments against Calvinism, but they've really kind of left me no other choice. So here one, we are. One more comment I wanted to make on the free thinking argument, and then I'll go, we'll get off the hobby horse. I'll get off the hobby horse. I'm not going to speak for everybody. But one of the things that gets me about the free thinking argument that, well, I don't understand why Christians would even adopt things like Calvinism or the like determinism or compatibilism or any of those those types of systems. And it's mainly because Christianity has something that no other system could possibly affirm, which is you actually are a free moral agent that is not dictated or controlled by anything else. You are free to yeah. make choice between A and B. It is a very unique thing set with Christianity because we acknowledge the existence of individuals, whether that's you know individual souls or uh, as far as like uh, substance dualism or whether that is an idealism view, whatever. But an individual has autonomy. And that is so that's very unique that because that's that kind of deals with our direct experience. Now, whether people think that's convincing or not, it's neither here nor there. But it's just weird to me that we are in a unique position to be able to speak to that direct acquaintance that everyone has with reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet so many Christians would abandon it because they have a particular view of Scripture as opposed to maybe thinking that your view of Scripture is wrong. I just mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it because it's such an appeal to people when you when you start getting like an unbeliever to realize what you're saying that they have no epistemic justification to believe any of their stuff because it's all been it's all va na nature versus nurture and you start seeing those light bulbs going off mm -hmm. suddenly you start seeing them actually like wow Christianity actually is more attractive because it does have a justification for my lived reality so mm -hmm. I just I don't understand I don't understand why Christians would that's neither here nor there we'll talk about that when it gets to when i get to my uh section but that's that's all i wanted to make sure i uh, last thing i'll say uh based on what you just said is and i and i've uh discussed this in a paper i wrote with jp moreland uh called an uh an, ex an explanation and defense of the free thinking argument and I, I've, I've got it um there's a i've got another essay that's about to be published where i really kind of unpack this even more but here's the thing, like you said, Christianity is in a unique position where, um, and, and this doesn't apply to Calvinism, by the way, the, the Calvinistic determinists, but everybody else, from Molinists to Arminians to open theists, uh, provisionists, you know, all these other Christians, um, we have access to the fact that God is a God of truth. Uh, you know, John 14, 6, you know, I'm the way the truth I am the I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? God, so we worship a God of truth who also desires all people to know the truth. That's literally what scripture says. First Timothy 2 4. All right. So we worship a God of truth who desires all people to know the truth. Therefore, he gives us the power. And I think it's a supernatural God-given power. He gives us the power to be able to infer truth about ultimate reality, you know, metaphysics and theology. He gives us the power to do metaphysics and get ultimate reality right if we're careful, if we handle these supernatural powers carefully. And as they say in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And so we, if you use your power responsibly, you can, it's not a guarantee, but you can get ultimate reality right. And if not, then we're just our beliefs about theology and metaphysics is up to God. And if you get things right, it's because he made you. And if you get things wrong, it's because he determined you to get things wrong and also determined you to think that you got it right. So that's a big problem. But anyway, I'm, now I'm repeating myself. So. You, you wanted to say something, Warren? I saw you oh. on mute. <clears throat> Oh no no no! I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was over here listening. I'm I'm trying to be very respectful of everyone and give everybody time to talk and and I don't want to um, interrupt. You know, this is a large group of guys. So when I came here, I was like, I'm not speaking unless spoken to. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but no, I, I like I like Tim's uh, free thinking argument. I, I think that um, it's and it, it doesn't just impact every belief, right? Because it, it does, but we're not we're not saying like. <clears throat> I need to clean my desk off. So I have some props here. It's not like God determined me to prefer Snapple peach tea diet over LaCroix, you know, limoncello. That is a relatively inconsequential, you know, choice. 
We're, we're talking about, and, and that is under the umbrella of exhaustive divine determinism. That's everything has been determined, <clears throat> but also he's determined me in my views of baptism. He's determined my views on yeah. salvation. He's determined mm -hmm. whether or not I'm actually trusting in him or a false construct that he's erected in my mind of him so that I don't have actual saving faith. Yeah. And so, you know, my own, my own issues with, with Calvinism derived from Augustinian anthropology. So there's a really nice corollary here between Tim's deity of deception argument and how Augustinian anthropology is an assault on our God-given faculties and, and sense-making. Because with total depravity, we're told that we're created incapable of rightly understanding and accepting any spiritual thing. And so we have to be regenerated first. But regeneration is itself a spiritual thing that's negated and undercut by that starting premise of that total uh, de depravity or that total inability. And so for me, when I'm looking at Calvinism, it seems to be an assault on our God-given faculties, our, our sense-making, one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. And you end up almost, and I, I, <clears throat> I'm trying not to be polemical. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm probably not going <laughs> to succeed. It's, I speak, I, I English is not my first language. Choose polemics violence. Is, polemics is my first language. Okay. <laughs> but it seems to be that within, and, and let me open it up even beyond just Calvinism. So I'm not just picking on these guys, but I think within Augustinianism at large, I think it's an assault on our God given sense making and faculties, our ability to interface with truth to use our God-given faculties responsibly, as Tim has repeatedly noted that Scripture shows we can. And it's a form of, of spiritual gaslighting where we are to surrender our sense-making to this system. So in this regard, we cease conforming to the image of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And instead, we start conforming ourselves to this predetermined mold of presuppositional systematic thought. And um, I think it's extremely dangerous to the, not just the salvation of, of, of people. And I don't, I don't know how you dismiss, like diminish just the salvation, but every aspect of the Christian walk um, mm -hmm. from the way that we interact with the Lord to the way that we interact with our pastors, our spouses, our children, our brothers and sisters in the faith um, to the unbeliever. This has, Wide, I mean, it affects literally everything, and um, it seems it seems to uh, be an assault on our ability to actually have any confidence in the truth. And as Tim has noted, you know, you'll know the truth, and it will set you free. How, but we know the truth, right? But if we're if we have been determined to believe a lie, we we can never have any confidence in that. If we believe that our starting faculties are so broken that they're incapable of knowing the truth, that we can never have any confidence in that. But to, to ramp things up a, a smidge here, another issue that I see with Calvinism as it relates to total depravity um, is its, its assault on the incarnation and redemptive work of Christ. Because in the, in the writings of the early church, and, and we're talking New Testament and, and beyond, um, Christology is soteriology. The fact that God assumed human nature to heal, redeem, and restore us is part of his soteriological work, his, his healing. He's the great physician. By his stripes we're healed. He assumed our nature. You know, we're seated with him in heavenly places. And so I think with total depravity, not only do you have a, a further assault on our God-given faculties and sense-making, but you end up having to negate this strong view of the incarnation where Christ assumes our nature like us in every respect and instead becomes like a pre-fallen Adam where Adam needed no redeemer. And so, you know, he, he's taking on a nature that didn't need redeeming instead of elevating our broken nature. And, um, and so I see that as in opposition to scripture. I see it in opposition to some of the early churches uh, writings. I see it in opposition to the the development of even like the hypostatic union with uh, Gregory of um, Nazianzus, I believe it was, who said, 
whatever he didn't assume he did not heal he did not redeem yeah that's gregory nancy Anzus. that which is not that which he did not assume is not healed and so so you end up you end up with this idea where because of our totally depraved ontological condition christ can't assume that to heal it lest he be corrupted and so you end up with him assuming a human nature unlike ours and we're left without a redeemer and so the whole point is is that he came down and became one of us that like Hebrews 2 14 through 18 says he shared in all of the things that the offspring of Abraham had in common and that's flesh and blood it's ontology and it's because that is the means in which he is our faithful uh, and, and and merciful high priest and so I see it as an assault on the redemptive work of Christ and so like if we and I again I use strong language because I think scripture uses strong language here and I say this and I I said I wasn't going to come on here and talk about being a former Calvinist because I do that so much. But I, I'm not doing that to say because I was an I'm a former Calvinist, therefore my opinion on everything is right. I'm saying when I was a Calvinist, I loved Jesus. Okay. So I'm not coming in here saying what I'm about to say may sound really harsh, but this is a rebuke of me when I was in that buzzword mindset, right? But I still love Jesus when I had that mindset. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully I've given enough clarification. Probably haven't. Um, <laughs> but if if we go over to First John four two through three, we see that we the Spirit of God confesses that Christ has come in our flesh, but the Spirit of Antichrist rejects this. This was written to the Docetists, to the Gnostics. It was a a refutation against those who denied the very incarnation of Christ. And um, and I see this as being extremely problematic if we say Christ assumed a pre-fallen nature, because we're not saying he had our flesh, because we're, we're making, per Augustinian anthropology, there's a distinction between our, our flesh and Jesus's. And so I see that as, as falling under the condemnation of 1 John. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean you don't love Jesus. It just means you have a bad view of the sociological work of, of Christ and the incarnation. So there's so much here that I see like a little thread of Calvinism. We start to tug on it and it just starts to unravel like, you know, Weezer's sweater, you know, like in the, the 90s, <laughs> you know, as you walk away, the thing just begins to unravel. And if, as you keep walking, if you just hold on to that one thread, eventually there's nothing left. And, um, and I think it begins with, a deity of deception. I believe it begins with an ontology of inability of ever knowing the truth. Um, I believe it conforms us to an image of something other than Christ. And I think ultimately it denies the incarnation and redemptive work as laid out in scripture. Not that it denies the incarnation of Christ, but it pivots. And I think it, it changes it substantially enough to where it causes a question as to, well, then why did Christ come? And then you get into a, atonement theories and everything just starts spiraling. And so I know as a Calvinist, when I started to see total depravity unravel, I saw all of those spinning plates, you know? Like you see the old guy on the, the stick and he's spinning a plate and he's trying to spin the plate and he doesn't want any of them dropping. I started to see some things wobble and it all started to collapse. And it was a very terrifying process because ultimately I was like, well, what is what is Christianity if this system, if this system isn't it? Because I'd, I'd so surrendered my sense making that I, I was I was just in in, in pure terror. Um, but I, I think I think there's beauty in coming to Christ with these tough tough issues. And I'm not saying Calvinists don't. You know, I'm just I can all I can speak of is me. Um, but I found real beauty in coming to Christ and going, man, I got it really wrong. I know nothing but you crucified and rose again. Like that's it. And, and, uh, and now, now I, I think I've, I, I know that maybe that plus one or two other things, you know, but, but the one or two yeah. other things that I think I know, and even the foundational thing I think is, is, is un, unwavering. That is the incarnation redemptive work of Christ makes Calvinism untenable for a biblically robust, uh, adherence. I, I just, I don't see how I can connect those dots anymore knowing what I know now. And it's not, um, it's not to kick these guys out of the kingdom. I have family that love the Lord. 
I have family that are Calvinists and they won't discuss Calvinism with me. You know, like they're like, I love you, Warren, and we're not going to do this. I want you to be able to come over for Thanksgiving and family functions. Mm -hmm. And I go, I love you. And I would like to be able to come over for family functions, you know? And so we just don't engage in it as, as much as I would like, but it doesn't mean that I don't think that they're saved or they don't think I'm saved. It's just really strong disagreement on doctrine. But I do believe these issues present, I think, an insurmountable problem for for the, for Calvinism. And I, I, when you talk about killing Calvinism, I, I think Calvinism in context or Scripture in context kills Calvinism. And so I think on every one of its unique distinctives, it just wilts. It just it just falls apart. Um, but I went all that time without talking, and then I've monopolized the the time. So I'm gonna. Stop talking now. Will, it's your turn. Tag, you're it. Well, first it's totally off, fine. I handed you, you the baby. It's totally fine. Uh, so first Don't off. Don't babies I, into this, please, Josh. <laughs> dude, what are you doing, man? Dude, uh, I mean, <laughs> like sacrificing a bale or so I hear. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll keep it in hand. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, 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 Warren. But it was, I mean, it's fine. I'm not commenting. I'm throwing you on the pyre. Um, I'm just, I'm just gonna keep. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so to your point, Warren. So it's funny. I made a prediction before we did this, and I was like, "All right, I, if I know Warren and Tim at all, these are the arguments that they're gonna make." And sure enough, you did. So I was like, "I'm really glad I did not choose the same ones because we did not share notes." Nope. Um, but I will say, Tim's. And Warren's points are definitely my first, like, if five groupings of reason reasoning. But I do want to make sure I commented that a lot of people don't realize that the point of Augustinian anthropology of inherited guilt and total depravity actually does have serious in implications to the incarnation and that he was like us in every respect and how so like like you said incarnate the incarnation is soteriology and even when people and everyone most everyone who follows our channel knows the fact that in the next few months i'm going to have a book published on the atonement and what a lot of people don't seem to realize is the fact that the, like even when the church used the term penalty they weren't talking about god be like punishing jesus they really were talking about the penalty or the the disadvantage if you will of becoming a mortal man and uh so there's so there's a lot of language that people we have a tendency to do that to read anachronistically reading our modern lenses into ancient texts and when they use certain words even though they're the same words we use they did have a kind of a different dictionary so we have to be careful and it also depends what time period like the early tr earliest church fathers versus like medieval fathers versus modern you know so anyway i really appreciated what you said warren um and dr stratton so now the as far as my issues are concerned um now i'm in a bit of a different position uh josh real quick were you ever a calvinist i was yes actually yeah okay so this puts me in a very unique position uh in the entire panel here but i would be the only individual here then that was never a calvinist <laughs> and so uh i'm smarter than all of you well no, none of us actually understand calvinism so it's okay <laughs> okay all right cool so uh <laughs> but um i was raised and th so this is important to understanding why i didn't latch on to calvinism i was raised in in this really intense uh king james only independent fundamental baptist camp okay women wore skirts men wore ties uh nothing with drums all that uh fire and hell brimstone preaching kind of thing and i was raised in that and as a king, king james onlyist and as i started studying things in my late teens to the like to 20 years old i found the works of, of dr james white and dr james white of course has a lot of debates and stuff on textual criticism and history and he debated a lot of people in king james onlyism and had a, has a whole series on king james onlyism and i i mean he kind of shattered my world i read his book then i picked up other books and that was like where I, I'd already like let, shed a lot of the legalism from the independent fundamental Baptist, but this was like a crux issue for them because if the King James is wrong, everything else 
crumbled in their system. So once I realized that I was no longer King James only as I started listening to the dividing line and radio for Geneva as one does. And he would talk about reformed theology. And then I was like, what is reformed theology? So I look at I look up some stuff from James White and I was like, I don't think that's true. Then I found a bunch of stuff by Matt Slick. And I mean, I did. I, I mean, I dug into his website, reading through it. And the more I read it, the more I just like I, this sounds funny. Uh, I had like an angry reaction the more I read it. And, and I felt like I was almost duped into it because I was following this guy and really like, like, OK, sure. He's using some technical jargon, but I and I didn't fully understand because I was a very ignorant, independent, fundamental Baptist kid. And now I've seen a lot of actually my friends who are raised in it who left the independent fundamental Baptist, the IFB for short, go into reformed camps. And there are some things that I've noticed as to why this happens. And they're the exact reasons why I couldn't latch onto it. Because as soon as I realized King James Onlyism was false and I understood textual history, it came down to this fact that things that contradict cannot be true. If it contradicts, it cannot be true. This is very simple if anyone's familiar with the laws of non-contradiction. And at the very bottom of, of um, Calvinism is a violation of this law. It is a law, it is an entire system built on incoherency. Now, one of the things that a lot of people say is that, well, it's incoherent within itself, but not really, because as Dr. Stratton has already pointed out, you can't even trust your own mental faculties. The, the fact that God can hold you responsible for sin while also determining you or giving you the desires to do sin before the foundations of the world really started striking against me. And then I don't see how God could say that he holds, there was no, he had, uh, now a lot of people have issues with the way all is defined. So that's what a lot of people, you know, that, therefore all have, you know, God loved the whole world, whosoever, there's a lot of that stuff. But some of the things I couldn't get around was God shows no partiality. Well, if he selects people based for his own glory, for his judgment or his mercy, that was like, well, that is partiality if you're just selecting it uh, to your secret will. So I was, these are those areas that it, all of it was like, God says this, but he determined that they contradict. You just have to deal with it because God logic. It's always the, because God can. And if you go back into what Warren was talking about with Augustinian anthropology, uh, the, I can't, I, I think the, is a similar, it's very close to this, but Augustine said the laws of, or, or like the laws or the rules of logicians do not apply to God. And once I realized that at the very heart of this system is the fact that they realize it's contradictory, or at least the fathers did, maybe a lot of reformed people don't today because we're talking about the ism, not the people. Mm -hmm. But some people realized that back then. And so they had to come up with a new system to break out with, which is a, the, simply, a, well, I guess it must not apply to God because this is the system. So as I kind of realized that, okay, things that contradict cannot be true, this is to contradict everything. Like what he, for another thing that I, I couldn't get around was just this idea of God says, be holy as I am holy. Then I kept going, but what is that? What does it mean to be holy then? How am yeah. I to be like you? Because I can't be like you in any way, shape or form, because you can damn someone to hell, but I can't. I'm actually supposed to give them the gospel, apparently. I'm not to lie, but you can lie. And uh, I'm not, I am to hold people uh, morally responsible like they could do otherwise. And you can hold them morally responsible when they can't do otherwise. So I just kept, so for me, the epistemological issue, and I did not know that was the word at the time, that was an epistemological issue, I couldn't get around. So the law of non-contradiction uh, and the law of identity that God is God and God can't be not God were th like the laws of logic were things I really held on to as I left the independent fundamental Baptists because I realized how incoherent so many, so many of their teachings were. Now, the second thing that uh, uh, reason why I can't accept it besides, again, what the esteemed individuals have said before me. Uh, whom I agree with. And Brian will have uh, some unique takes as well, because he also was he was raised Calvinist and he left the Calvinism. Uh, but um, 
which by the way, Brian, we had a, 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 a Brian Ray saw it, but we actually literally did have a guy in the chat saying that Brian must never have really understood Calvinism, which is hilarious today. We got the comment and I was like, oh, of course, there's always one. But anyway, always got to uh, happen. Yeah, you're you were catechized and everything, but boom, don't understand it. Uh, so anyhow, but the other issue I had was the wooden approach to scripture. And there's no other way to put it besides a very wooden approach with Western eyes. Because what started getting me to leave the IFB was, what does the Bible really say about these things? And what did it say within its uh, historical context? What did these words mean? And that's what kind of led me down to where I'm at now theologically. But because the IFB would read a text where it says like, and they pulled up their, uh, they pulled up their, claw clothes or their claws and they revealed the nakedness of their thigh suddenly the ifb goes see your thigh equals being naked so if you show your thigh at all you're being hyper immodest like that was the level of hermeneutic they'd take and it sounds silly to so many of us but when you it's freaky actually when you read some of the wooden approaches that the reformed or the calvinists will take to certain texts that they will morph a text into just because it mentions grace they will make that like phrase mean something entirely different than what it says right in front of you at a very simple reading. Uh, so one of the things is right here actually was, I think many people, sorry, prudence make frugal. What did they say? I think many people get into Calvinism because of what leading Calvinists have said against other doctrines or behaviors. The discernment ministries can be uh, recruitment tactics. Absolutely. Um, so what I have issue with is the anachronistic approach to scripture, where we read our pres presumptions into the text, we divorce it from its historical context, and we read it woodenly. Luckily for me, I did not get pulled into Calvinism, and I think it's because I already had hyper red flag aware, super awareness of that issue that people do when reading scripture. Uh, so like one of the issues is, is grace, right? So everyone is very familiar with anyone who knows Augustine's teaching, how grace eventually shifted meanings into um, almost a gnosis, right? A, a new knowledge that's that's imparted onto your mind to bring you into belief. And I know that gets people in trouble when you compare it to Gnosticism, but let's call it the way it is. Um, but when you really get into the historical context of like what Paul would mean, he actually, and it's pretty well attested to by scholars and historians that he's using patron client relate like relations here. So he's talking to patron as in, okay, I, let's say can't afford, I can't feed my family because I don't have enough crops. So I go to a rich person like Warren, let's say, who is a, pa a patron in this sense. And I go, I can't feed my family. I need crops and I can't work anymore for them. Right. I can't earn them because I already have tried and I failed because I can't feed my family enough. And he acts favorably upon me and grants me crops. And now I have them so I can feed my family. That is having grace. Back then, grace really meant, in a sense, to just act in favor toward people. You know, so when someone does so, it's a very gracious gift. And then suddenly, now, if you ask somebody what grace means, many of them will say, giving you something you don't deserve. And they bring it like this idea of deserve and worm theology in it, right? That mankind sucks. <laughs> and so grace in that area uh, is, is one of that. So when you get into... Uh, like Romans and you start understanding like the language he's actually using or like even falling short of the glory of God. A lot of us think glory is falling short of the glory of God in our context is like breaking a moral law. But really back then it's connected to Psalm chapter eight, which is the crowning glory of God's creation, which is the Imago Dei, which goes back to Josh's point which is the fact that we are God's crowning creation and that to fall short of God's glory means that we're, we fell short of our vocation, not that we are suddenly these worthless sinners. So as you start understanding how these things were all connected to each other in its historical context and the fact that we can pretty much verify it through history today with all the academics that we have in front of us, I'll be honest, and I'll say it very directly here, I don't know how Calvinism can still stand when we know where the roots of it are, where we could trace it so easily back and also look at things so historically and go, that's not even remotely close to what they were talking about at the time. And yet here we are. Like, um, so anyway, uh, those those are the two big things for me. The, the laws of logic just kept showing contradiction after contradiction to the point where I would have to shed reality entirely to believe it. 
which I've said it before to Brian, I think privately, I'm not sure if we've said it on stream, but I'll say it on stream here. That way it's not on us, it's on you guys here. You can take the hate for me. Uh, but like I've said it before, like, okay, if those were true, I would probably not be a Christian because I would, if Calvinism was exactly what the Bible taught, I'd probably not be a Christian and not because um, I have like boohoo, my feelings are hurt, but because it, it creates so many contradictions within what is taught that I wouldn't know. I would, I would just say it can't be true. Uh, the Bible must not be true then. Luckily, that's not the only interpretation even closely uh, offered to us. And then also the anachronistic wooden view of scripture, I think, is another reason to reject Calvinism. Oh, that's the other thing. Sorry. I want to make sure I mentioned in that whole like chatter, elect is the other problem because people look at it as an individual election unto salvation. And that's a Western individualistic look at how election and covenants worked. Covenant always was if you, then I. That's how covenants always work, right? I will do this if you do that. All right, this is a covenant and a promise with us. And so election really is, it's covenant language. And it's if you do this, then you are part of that. And if that's the case, that's how you get part of this group. It really is this corporate election unto what? Unto serving the kingdom of God. It really is ne has never been about God plucking people into individual salvation. Not once has it ever been about that. And again, it, this is why they're, they're the, a lot of the Pauline work has been so important because it's like, no, no, we are reading it as individualist, individualism, really, which is what a lot of our theology is corrupted with. And back then, they weren't really worried about individual salvation. They were worried about identity and a covenant with God and the kingdom coming at that's coming at hand. They want to be part of it, but it wasn't really about the individual in that sense, if that makes sense. So uh, they weren't as individually focused as we are. So I concur. I, I not concur. I, I concede the rest of my time that I've hogged. And of course, I concur with myself. <laughs> I would hope so. I, I expect you to. Uh, I, I really enjoy the way that this is flowing so far. It's really, really... Like, you guys are being very concise, and I appreciate that. Um, as far as if I could add anything to where we've gone so far, I think really, like like I said, in my heart, the, the emphasis is on the reality, the reality of the image of God as the basis for human value, human identity, human purpose, and the meaning of our lives day to day, moment to moment. And in the grander scam scheme of things, if we don't have meaning and value, if we don't have an intent or a purpose outside of, let's say, uh, fulfilling whatever personal fancy God had in glorifying himself, but we actually have this real purpose, like a real meaning on the ground floor in our living as well, right? Because there's only so much I can the theologize away my lack of purpose or meaning in my own experiences, right? And so for me, especially as somebody who has... Uh, let's say overcome, I, I've overcome uh, uh, bouts of suicidality and am now not in a place where I, I feel that darkness and that pull anymore. And I day to day am able to look out and see God's fingerprints. You know what I mean? I can see God's high level of intent. I can see the, the, the living out of purpose and the experience of meaning and those things. And I can, I can willfully participate in that as though it were true because it is. I cannot live as though I am determined and all of my thoughts were prescribed by someone other than my, I cannot live as though that's true um, without ending up in solitary confinement or white padded walls. Um, I, I think ultimately if we were going to act that out, and I think that's where a lot of this comes to for me is practically speaking, I need to be able to act out the truth, mm -hmm. right? I need to be able, and this is, and this is the thing, if we're, if we're going to look at something at a high level, like let's say sin, which is ultimately the problem that I think salvation is trying to, deal with in a really generalized sense. If we define sin as primarily a moral infraction against the law, we have a difficult time of defining what sin was for Adam and Eve, right? We have a difficult time of explaining what sin was for Satan, perhaps. And we use this generic idea that sin is missing the mark. It's an archery term. What is the mark? A lot of people would think that that's moral perfection as prescribed by the law. I would say Sin, in its most specific sense, is anything that deviates from divine intent for you or anyone around you. Anything that I do that causes a deviation from someone else's divine intent. You are an imager. 
and I am doing damage. You see what I'm saying? And so this, this damage is to disorder God's intent. And I think that's ultimately what sin is. And if that's what sin is, then it, it, it creates a, a different kind of texture about what it is that, that we think is being overcome, what it is we're being saved for or from, and what it is that the image of God is meant to be. What it means to fall short of the glory is to falsely image God in that most direct sense, right? And so if that's the case, then this kind of adds a level of depth to the situation that I don't think Calvinism proper has accounted for in my experience as a Calvinist when I was a Calvinist. None of those were, were, were players on the field, if that makes sense. And so with the emphasis on the image of God as human value, human importance, uh, the purpose and the meaning, that lived meaning that you experience day to day, moment to moment with your families, your friends, with your losses, with your gains and rewards, and anything that has anything to do with blame or praise. There needs to be a ground floor for that. And I think that for me, that was what was deeply missing in my experience as a Calvinist. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people that I've talked to privately that have shared that experience. Um, but that's something that for me, like I said, working in the in the the field that I do, um, where I'm technically I'm a maintenance guy, but I'm also doing a lot of person to person counseling with the people who are in the program where I work, um, because I'm not in a position of authority over them. A lot of the time, they're more willing to confide in me because they see me. I'm like a fly on the wall. I'm the guy that plunges the toilets. They're not embarrassed to talk to me. You know what I mean? And so they'll confide in me, and I have a lot to say about. Sorry, hold on. A motorcycle's going by. I, I have a lot to say to them about their th their purpose, their intent, where they are versus where they could be, what their potential is. And I don't think potential exists in a deterministic world, like in the most literal sense. And I don't think that personhood in the way that I'm trying to define it as that meaningful purposive identity exists in the Calvinistic deterministic kind of system either. And what you get in, let's say, a brass tacks, the end game of what I came to in my Calvinism is something like divine solipsism. God is the only real person. God is the only real person. I'm, I'm a synthetic personhood. I have the experience of being a person, but my experiential agency is where it lives. That's where it ends. I don't actually have genuine moral agency to, to be the source of my decisions as we would all affirm mm -hmm. with libertarian freedom is I'm the source of my decision. Even if my decision is not from alternative possibilities. I'm still the source of that decision. Yeah. And that is the ground floor of why I'm blameworthy or praiseworthy for any given action because I'm a person. Mm -hmm. Amen. Does that make sense to you guys? Oh yeah. I love how you, you brought up purpose and you know, I've, I've written a lot about the, the moral argument and why I think it's a good argument. And I think a, a lot of times the reason why, it might not be as persuasive to some as because, uh, well, I'll just say, I think the way I, I phrase it has been helpful for many because I, I say, look behind the idea of these, um, of, of objective morality is, is the idea that you were created on purpose and for a specific purpose to, uh, until, you know, what, you know, the two greatest commands to love God and to love everybody and where there's more to it, but, but we can say, Hey, the, uh, you know, um, you were created on purpose and for the specific purpose to love. So if God created you on purpose and for a specific purpose, and there would be objective facts about your uh, existence that are true, uh, irrespective of the subjective opinions of the person. Okay. So I say, you've got to, you have to have been created on purpose and for a specific purpose. And then you have to be able to have uh, libertarian freedom to choose to live according to the purpose or not. And if you don't have freedom to live according to the purpose, then there's no missing of marks as you brought up. Um, in fact, one of the points that I didn't get to um, in my five points, I, I do a low view of God, a low view of God's word, a low view of man, the, the image of God a low view of sin, a low view of the gospel. Let's talk about that fourth point, the a low, low view of sin, since you brought it up. Um, there's, there's no, it's hard to make sense of rebelling against God if you always do exactly what God determines you to do. You know, did Hitler rebel against God? If God determined him to think and act and desire to do what he did and to actually pull it off exactly as he did it. 
God determined him to do it. He didn't rebel against God. Adam and Eve didn't rebel against God. Um, it, it's, Satan a law didn't non, rebel. it's a law of okay. non-contradiction again, right? Like yeah, I right. can't uh, like, well, I'm sinning when I do the will of God, but I'm commanded to do the will of God. So you can't have both of them. It doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a low view of sin. <laughs> and by that, I mean, uh, we, we ought to have a higher view of sin in the sense that when we sin, we did it. We were the source of the sin. Don't say the devil made me do it. And you better not say God made me do it. No, take ownership of it. You were the source of your sin and you could have done otherwise. Um, at least the first Corinthians 10, 13 is is true god promises to provide a way of escape every time we're tempted to sin and so at least this is true of christians and i know that i still struggle with sin and so every time i do sin well i know that i could have done otherwise and taken that way of escape that god promises to provide but i failed to take it and that's why i can't blame it on god and i better not blame it on satan either on the devil or anybody else it was up to me and that's why I am responsible for that sin. So it's hard to make sense of what it means to sin, what it means to rebel if we're completely determined. Does a, does a puppet ever rebel against the puppet master? No. It all, the puppet always does exactly what the puppet master makes it do. So, And I think also, just, just to kind of dig down a little bit more on some of the analogies that I've heard to explain what you're talking about, Tim, uh, with this whole puppet or robot analogy and why that's uncomfortable. And there's uh, a dislike of the use of causation in that sense. Um, we, we know that there's become a, a popular analogy around authorship and novels and stories. As you guys can see my tag uh, right here, I'm the storyteller. Narrative is my, like, that's my wheelhouse. Like, I love story. I love narrative. I love fantasy. I love nonfiction. I love history. I love story, right? One of the craziest and coolest things about the view that I was describing before about meaning and purpose and participation in your purpose through the meaningful life that you live day to day, moment to moment, is that I believe what the image of God amounts to in that context, to that analogy that I think is sorely lacking in the Calvinist version of that analogy is in fact that we are meant to be co-authors in time with God, which again is the basis for our blameworthiness and praiseworthiness in the analogy at all. Because as you said, not just a puppet can't deviate from its strings, a character cannot deviate from the plot unless they are granted the privilege and the responsibility of being alongside the author as active participants in the story ongoing. And I do believe that because scripture is 80 plus percent narrative, and we live in that same world that that narrative took place in. We don't live in Middle Earth, and the Bible is not a fantasy. It's real. We live in that world. That's the story that we are currently participating in right now. And that's either real or fictional. And I would not go so far as to say, to make the analogy, that reality is fictional for the sake of God's authorship really gets us anywhere but in trouble. Excellent points tonight, Josh, brother. Man, I'm 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 loving it. We, <clears throat> I'll just get the popcorn and listen to you for a little while, man. This is that's golden. Yeah, I think you should uh, take that <laughs> mic and just drop it somehow. <laughs> I mean, divine well, I, solipsism I, and and the the co-authoring of the of the narrative. Oof, some good points tonight, man. Well, and I think I think that that unfortunately, because we're like you said in a Western context, will. We don't often think about story as the superpower that it is. Story and music are the closest thing to magic that I know of. Well, you actually, know, it's, like it's funny. You, those are our... Sorry, it's Go funny ahead. you say that because, I mean, that's kind of the way people would describe it a lot of times back in the day. Um, and that's why they were an oral culture. The, the, the way these were written even were to tell a narrative. That's the whole point. Like you read the book of Judges, it's telling you a narrative for, on purpose to convey a story. There's a reason why people latch on to Tolkien, Harry Potter, and all of these because it's conveying very deep truths through a story because it helps us connect with what the actual message is. Uh, I just got done reading the Silmarillion and I was blown away by so many cool undertones throughout that I was like, yeah, this isn't something you'd hear in a in a sermon, I wouldn't be able to resonate with this in this way in a sermon I, because 
most of the time sermons are point by point. They're not usually telling a story. Um, I think that's also why Dr. Jonathan Williams' recent book on Romans nine is so different for a lot of people. And I've he, I've heard nothing but he was just like, on here actually. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he just on it. So check out that episode and check out the Church Splits episode with him. Anyway, uh, but it's the same thing where it, he tells the story and the narrative of Romans nine. And I've had a lot of people like, dude, I've done a ton of study in Romans nine, and his is such a breath of fresh air because it's narrative. So absolutely, that's absolutely it. By the way, uh, Brian, I don't want to steal your thunder. I know you still got your stuff to talk about too. So yeah, whenever. I mean, yeah, no, feel free to jump in, Brian. This is we're, <laughs> we're, we got an open floor. So as long as we're not stepping on each other's toes, there's a little bit of delay on my end. I can't tell if I'm talking over you guys because I have a little bit of lag, but feel free to, to hop in whenever you want, man. Yeah, well, I guess at risk of uh, triggering Bill Gate part two, the you know, I grew up in Calvinism and I would say that the main thing that really started pulling me out was actually infant baptism. And so I, I grew up CRC. I went to Calvin Church. I went to, got my degree from Calvin College. Um, my grandpa's book that he wrote is on the bookshelf behind me that he, the first one to composite all of John Calvin's Latin translations of the Bible into one work. So it's like in my DNA, I was kind of, it's kind of the default position of where I live is your, your Calvinist, not just because it's decreed, but it's because it's, it's defined by culture. <laughs> but the thing that started pulling me out was really infant baptism. And, you know, that was one of the first things I kind of started talking to my pastor about. I was like, just give it to me. Like oh, this infant baptism, when I talk to people that are Baptists, they're like, you're crazy. And I'm like, all right, give me the good, give me the good pass early. And what I, what's the cool mic droppy verses I got to give these Baptists. And turns out uh, I had nothing in, in my ammo chamber. So that kind of started pulling the thread for me. And then when I started talking about and looking at what, my church was even saying during an infant baptism and they're, they're asking the parents to affirm that the baby that they're baptizing, they're baptizing there at 10 months, 11 months old. I was baptized at 10 months that they're baptizing them into the kingdom with the assumption that they will become Christian, that they are elect already and they will show their electedness through their life. And you are to raise those children with the assumption that they are elect. And when I kind of just took, took back and just like listened to what these parents were saying, what my parents had said, and it kind of really took me aback because one, I was like, I, especially now, right? I look back at the kids that I went to church with. A lot of them aren't Christian. They're not, they're definitely not going to that church. And a lot of them aren't Christian anymore. So were all those parents just wrong? And then you have to ask yourself why, do Christians tend to be from Christian families? Why is there this association of Christian families with Christian children that extra Christian? grace, extra grace, <laughs> extra grace? Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense if it's really this random thing. And then I think that really kind of brought up to me what's kind of the default criticism of Calvinism. If anyone's thought about it for thirty seconds, it's it's not necessarily the the, des the predestination or the decree of God before time of the elect, but it's the decree of the unelect. Those that God chose to create before the beginning of the world, knowing that they had no chance of salvation, he would give them scripture. He would tell them to read. He would tell them, command them to repent and they never would. And they're just like the Rome, like Calvinists would read Romans nine and say, they, they are the vessels of wrath. They were built for damnation only. And the fruit of that damnation and the fruit of their sin and their willingness to work against God throughout their whole life was for God's glory. And when you kind of take a step back and just like hear what people are saying about it, uh, it kind of shatters your view of what Christianity is and what the church is. So then you have to kind of make this decision. Is this form of Christianity Christianity? And do I, do I stick with it? Or do I go back to scripture, re-examine it and say, does it actually say what they're saying? Well, it turns out it doesn't actually say that total depravity is a thing that we're unable to believe the gospel. It turns out that uh, there's no such thing as irresistible grace. It turns out that there are conditions for salvation. And so once you kind of start stacking up the acronym of TULIP, the doctrines of grace, if you're wanting to sound a little bit more elegant in how you talk about it, you realize that it, the foundation of scripture is actually built on a, a several pillars of assumptions 
that, as Warren will attest and will too, go back to Augustine. And a couple mistranslations of the Latin word for desire, and here we are, you know, 1600 years later, debating about something that the early church never even considered. And so, Will and I say this all the time, our desire is to believe what the apostles believed. So whatever jargon gets me out of that way so that I can get to the true belief, if, if, if I'm allowed to believe it, it's not a belief that's been planted in my head, I want to learn it. I want to know it. And I, want, and I think the best source for that is scripture. And then I think the next best source for that is what the early church fathers were saying and how in their writings about scripture and how they understand. At least then I get their mindset. You know, I hear, you know, talk to hear from those that are learning directly from the apostles. How are they describing what they were taught? And what are the chances that they got it so woefully wrong after learning directly from those that were learning from Jesus? I think it's pretty unlikely. So I put a lot of weight in how how they're describing things so that I can add a little bit of a correct lens to scripture. But it really was baptism that started pulling that thread for me, especially infant baptism in the CRC church. And uh, my entire family is still CRC. I have a great love for them. We talked about it on our podcast last week that we almost need to, especially as internet apologists and YouTubers, we need to separate the internet Calvinists from the Calvinists because the internet Calvinists, they probably believe and think more of the things that we're kind of talking about that are wrong with Calvinism. The rest of Calvinists, they don't think about these things and they just think this is Christianity and if you were to even bring up most of the things that we're talking about, you'll get the response of that's not real Calvinism because they don't know. That's right. That's really the conclusions of Calvinism. So I think I have a heart for a lot of those Calvinists. They're <laughs> all my family members. And, uh, you know, it's a hard thing that maybe we can talk about a little bit. How do you approach the conclusions of Calvinism or the lack of scriptural evidence for Calvinism to the default Calvinist who isn't yeah. a Calvinist because of argumentation, but because that's what they're told. Yeah, that's. I was just talking to a pastor, a uh, local pastor, uh, the other day, and uh, he was like, "Tim, you know, Calvinism is biblical." I'm like, "Well, really? Uh, you're actually a Calvinist?" And uh, and I said, "Well, have you have you looked at the, my arguments against uh, divine determinism?" And, and he goes, "Well, a little bit. You know, I watched a couple of my YouTube videos." And he goes, "Well, I'm a compatibilist." And I'm like, "Oh, okay. So you're a pastor." And you preach compatibilism? And he goes, yes. And I said, well, how do you define compatibilism? And he says, well, that God is completely sovereign and you have real free will. And I said, now, by real free will, do you mean that when I'm tempted to sin, I have the power to either sin or take the way of escape? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, that's libertarian free will. You're, you're saying that I've got that kind of freedom? He goes, yes. And that is compatible with God's sovereignty. And I said, yeah, you know what it's not compatible with? Determinism. And I said, do you know what compatibilism is in the literature? And he, he had no idea. But, you know, so here's a pastor of a fairly big church preaching compatibilism <laughs> to his congregation, and he doesn't even know what it is. So I defined it for him. And I said, look, in the, in the literature, it's typically uh, uh, compatibilism is typically defined as uh, there's uh, some kind of freedom and or moral responsibility is compatible with what determinism and determinism as i defined here earlier has a specific definition i defined that for him and then once he understood determinism and then i, I brought first corinthians 10 13 back to him and i said and i explained that and i said so do you see is first corinthians 10 13 compatible with your new understanding of determinism and he goes no it's not. And I said, exactly. So I said, are you still a compatibilist? And he goes, oh, no, I guess I'm not. You know, so but but like you said, there's a difference between the online Calvinist and the skull. And it really, uh, there's several different levels here. You got to go to the academic uh, Calvinist philosophers and theologians that contribute to the academic literature. Look at what they're saying. Then you look at these loud Internet Calvinists. Look at what they're saying. And then you look at what the average Calvinist pastor and Sunday school teacher and church layman who affirms Calvinism is saying, and they're all over the place. So, so much of what I do is uh, now I've, I've learned uh, the hard way about being more philosophically precise with uh, my definitions. That's why I'm doing a second edition of my book. I plugged 
uh, my book earlier and uh, realized I need to tighten up a few things. Um, so I'm working on that. But now it's like I, I don't have a conversation with even a, a, an average Calvinist pastor without going into definitions and helping them understand these things. So that's kind of a, a pain sometimes. But you ask, how do we do that? I, I say, hey, let's uh, do you understand what, you know, I'll, I'll have them define their words for me well, uh, that they're I, uh, using. Yeah. Brian and I said, uh, we have a little t-shirt actually, it says it, uh, like make pastors theologians again. And I joke around because uh, we, it's of course meant to be a joke, but it's also like, it really is a problem. We send our pastors to seminaries and Bible colleges, and they still walk out theologically ignorant as all get out. And it's pathetic. That's really a bad look at our institutions. And the only way you get to those other levels, if you get a master's or a doctorate, it's like our guys with associate's degrees should know some of the basic stuff. But there was a Brian, you know him, there's an intern at my that church I was at before this. And he went to this uh, Bible college that w was very dispensational, but also very Calvinist. And they didn't see where like they're, I mean, the, the, the theology was, is contradicting everywhere that they teach at this place. And one person asks him about Calvinism because I'd gone through and taught theology in a theology class there. And apparently that uh, they're like, what do you think about Calvinism? And he goes, well, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but the way it was put to me and the way I think I understand it is Calvinism puts salvation in, in God's hand and Arminianism puts it in man's hands. Wow. And that was a guy with a bachelor's degree who spent thousands of dollars on the education, but he's a pastor. He's this intern pastor who's going, you know, going to move on to pastor his own church. And that's his level of elementary understanding of the topic. So I, and I, as frustrated as I was, not only with him, where I'm like, how can you be that sloppy and actually believe that that's actually a true strong, like a true view of it. But also, I was frustrated with the institution that that's what how, how poor of a job they did, and then I was also just uh, uh, disappointed the fact that this is like the people that are coming out of our Bible colleges, and he's not the only one. Okay, I'm not just trying to pick on this individual because it's something I see all the time. And I went to a Bible college for many years, and I switched to being a Trinity student, and. That was one of the better decisions I ever made because Trinity actually teaches this stuff. Now, granted, unfortunately, I did a lot of that study before I went to Trinity, but it was really nice to go to Trinity and go, oh, wow, look, they actually talk about this stuff. That's a, that's that's good. Wish Where were you guys years ago? Yeah, we take that <laughs> stuff seriously. <laughs> right on. Well, I actually have a couple of questions uh, from the chat, but before, before I bring any of those up, I was kind of wondering if we can... Uh, perhaps roll around a little bit. I know that there's obviously in scripture, there are, there's imagery and there's, there's use of language that centers around something like a legal context for God's relation to mankind. But it seems to me like Calvinism relies on that being the primary, if not the sole context in which God interacts with mankind. Um, do you guys see that overlap as well? And what do you make of that? What What is the role of the let's say legal language in scripture and uh about sin and judgment and so forth and what, what what should we conceive of as god's primary relation to mankind is it as judge and we as criminal or is that also an error of calvinism are we are we talking about relationships metaphorically analogically lacking any real literal connection because i'm not a classical theist and so i would say that in any sort of true hard classical theist sense, that that sort of depiction of God can't have any relationship. And I think that's one of the undercutting issues that we see within um, these stronger forms of Calvinism. They tend to hold more harder forms of classical theism. So they don't hold like a immutability of his holy character, but they say that he is uh, like a hard immutability that that he's utterly unchanging, you know, and that has issues with the incarnation. You have uh, impassibility. He, he doesn't have just a uh, godly emotion, but he can't have any emotion, you know? So um, my particular criticism comes from a non-classical theist position. And I would say that I think scripture is very clear that God is related to his creation and not in the sense of dependency where ultimately his sourcehood is dependent upon them, but that he responds, that he interacts, that he truly cares, that he guides, that he stewards, that he's grieved over their sin, that he's angry with their sin, and all of this stemming from his core being of, of love. 
Um, and so I, 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 I have no problem with certain forms of classical theism. If it's like a, not a hard form, I'm, I'm trying to nuance that as best as I can. Um, but I think in a lot of these issues with, especially the online Calvinists, it's, it's a hard form of classical theism where they'll say, if you don't affirm, you know, God predestined everything, you're not a Christian. And it's like, well, you don't even believe he predestined because you believe he's all temporal. You know, you don't even think he has foreknowledge because that requires him to be temporally located to that which he foreknows. So my criticism there may differ from some of the other members of the panel. Um, but I, I truly believe that God is related to his creation, that he's relational, that he's loving, that he's a good father, that he stewards, that he judges. That um, So that would that would be my two cents on that. Okay, fair enough. Any of the other guys have any thoughts on that before we uh, opt to put some of the, the questions here from the chat? Well, I'll just... Uh, oh, go, go ahead, Jim. No, not you. All right. I was going to say that uh, I think at a, at the heart, a lot of these issues stem from God's relationship with his creation. I think that's why probably many of us on the panel believe in this idea of freedom or libertarian freedom or free will is because in order for God to have a creation that loves him, they need to have the freedom to love him. Otherwise they are just being robots in love. And that's why anyone who's ever been in a romantic relationship has a desire for that, that person to love them freely and genuinely. If they don't, then it's not a real relationship. And uh, so I think we know that innately. And I think that's why, um, when we see kind of the underpinnings of Calvinism, it becomes such an affront to just the natural reality that we live in. And I think, I think our theology needs to comport with reality. And I think that's, that's one of the easy ways to see how Calvin, Calvinism is false. Cause it just doesn't comport with reality. You can't, you can't speak as a consistent Calvinist for more than 60 seconds because you can't speak in a way that isn't persuasive, isn't assuming that your actions will cause the actions of others, that you that you can't make a decision. You can't think like that. Are we're not we are not programmed even in the most uh, abstract sense to think in the way that it's it's that we're pre-programmed to do anything. Um, so I, I think relationship with God and his creation is very much one of the foundation reasons why Calvinism is false. So I think, you guys, I think that uh, I go, oh, ahead. No, go ahead, Tim. You're good. You're good. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to add, you know, both Warren and Brian just talked about uh, love and relationship. And, and uh, so I, l- let me give i I'm not going to give this whole argument. I'm going to give, uh, uh, I think six steps of it, but um, premise one, if irresistible grace is true, then for any person X, if God desires to, has the power to, and knows how to cause person X to go to heaven and not suffer eternally in hell, then person X will go to heaven and not suffer eternally in hell. Premise two, if God is omnibenevolent, perfect in love, uh, omnipotent, perfect in power, and omniscient, perfect in knowledge, Then for any person X, God desires to, has the power to, and knows how to cause X to go to heaven and not suffer eternally in hell. Premise three, there is at least one person who will not go to heaven and will suffer eternally in hell. Four, therefore, one cannot affirm both, one, that irresistible grace is true, and two, that God is omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient a.k.a. a maximally great being. Five, God is a maximally great being. Six, therefore, irresistible grace is false. Um, And then finally, I said, therefore, divine determinism is false. God does not determine all things. But here we've got a, a knockdown deductive argument against irresistible grace. And one of the reasons is, as, as you guys noted, is love. Because God is love, First John 4, 8. Um, once you factor in his perfect love, along with this perfect power and perfect knowledge, uh, you'll see that uh, you can't. One cannot affirm all of those and irresistible grace simultaneously, 
And as soon as that one, as soon as the eye leaves, you know, there goes Tulip. So, uh, yeah, just thought I'd throw that in there with the whole love thing. I mean, you guys were talking about us having the, 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 uh, we, that we need libertarian freedom to love God in, in return. I, I agree. But here we're, I wanted to say, hey, but because of God's love, when you factor that in there, that uh, ultimately is going to cancel out irresistible grace and tulip and, and more broadly. So that's a good point. Cool. Right on. Well, uh, if, uh, if it's okay with you guys, I have a couple of questions lined up from the chat that we can, uh, we can address. The first one uh, that popped up up was actually from facebook um nick here says Dis discuss this jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of god you crucified and killed but hold on you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men mm -hmm. acts chapter 2 verse 23 what yeah. what do you guys make is because i know there's there's enough to go around here and i'm sure that we don't all take the exact same vantage point for this verse but in, in the most generalized sense, I know that each of us here would have an answer for this. So what do you guys make of God's definite plan and foreknowledge of the crucifixion by lawless men? I wrote a book on it. It's called Human Freedom, Divine Knowledge, and Mere Molinism. <laughs> um, that's how I reconcile it. Uh, I, uh, that's, I spent a lot of time talking about the difference between predestination and predeterminism two completely different things. I think, I think personally, and Warren and I will, uh, this, you know, we're going to have some disagreements on this and still lock arms as brothers in Christ. <laughs> um, and, uh, but cause we're cool with disagreeing on, on these finer points, but, um, which, you know, more Christians should be cool with disagreeing with each other. Um, but, uh, that's another point. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I have, as a Molinist, I, I affirm, uh, predestination, but reject determinism and show, I, I at least argue that libertarian freedom is compatible with, um, this Molinistic predestination, which is not determinism by definition. Now the debate, um, where, where Warren and I would start to disagree just a little bit is, uh, that's maybe a little bit too close to determinism for him. And I can see that and understand it. And that's why his view would, uh, something along uh, his view would be my fallback position. Um, and uh, also why we get along well. Um, but um, yeah, I have, as a Molinist, no problem affirming Acts 2.23. Um, Warren, how would you, um, from coming from a slightly different perspective, how would you tackle it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see this as a, a reference, at least in part, to Genesis 3.15, uh, the Proto-Evangelium, where uh, God says, because Adam sinned, so this is a response, not an eternal divine decree that all of God's actions and attributes are identical with God in this kind of hard classical view that many Calvinists hold. So I would say that this is not, um, oh, yeah, dude, we, we need to do that. Actually, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, we, should, we should write a paper together. So I don't know. Yeah, yes, I'd, I'd love that. And um, uh, anyway, uh, if, if you want my stink on your paper, I'd be happy to, to offer it. Um, but uh, but I see I see Genesis 3.15 being the, the plan and it's a response to man's sin, not that God effectually and eternally decreed that man would sin. So the, the plan for the, the, the redemptive work of Christ is a response, not that... Um, this caught God unaware or anything like that, but that it was a response. And then I would also note that foreknowledge is a temporal, uh, means to know before this would be more in keeping with like revelation 13, eight, the God who was, who is, and who is to come. He has a, a present, he has a past and he has a future. This is potentiality. Um, so I would say that, you know, I have a larger argument to build here, but also foreknowledge. When we read this, we tend to assume that all things prior to now were eternally settled and set. But this, this could have been a determination made five minutes ago, five months ago, five years ago, or five ages ago, however we want to span and define age. So I think what happens is, is we tend to approach these texts with presuppositions where we just assume we know what's going on, and then we use it as a club to beat up people who might disagree. But like like Tim said, you know, that we we uh, we lock arms here, and that 
We don't see this teaching um, the Calvinist view of, of exhaustive divine determinism. Um, and, uh, and I would say that, um, that I don't believe that these lawless men could call, be called lawless if God is eternally and effectually decreeing their rebellion because they're not missing the mark in sin. They're hitting the bullseye. So I would say that, that um, Calvinism is completely incompatible with uh, Acts uh, 2.23 here for many reasons, but that would just be my fly-by, buzz-the-tower approach. Mm -hmm. I agree with that last bit there, especially because as, as I laid out before, the way I would define sin, and maybe this is idiosyncratic to me, but it seems to be a very functional definition of sin that can stretch back all the way to the beginning of mm -hmm. the entrance of sin through the fall in the garden, is that sin is a deviation from God's intent. And if determinism is true, nothing, repeat, 0% of reality deviates from God's divine intent. Nothing can deviate. Nothing could possibly deviate. That's what determinism entails. Well, and also, so I mean, and the Bible is... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, the, the, but oh, you're good. Paul even describes, and again, I'm not the only person who's pointed this out. Many people have pointed out. Paul describes sin as a, as a cosmic tyrant. It's not a just a breaking of a law like this is sort of record of yours. It's a cosmic tyrant that has brought corruption and as a whole. So that is the language he uses is this tyrant language. And once you understand that, you you kind of go determinism can't be true because then it just means that God put up another evil tyrant for him to what beat in front of everybody. He's like literally the guy who hires some dude to act like they're jumping him when he's on his first date with a girl so he can act like he beat him up <laughs> and then be like, dude, I can protect you forever, baby. Stay with me and his buddies aside on uh, the ground actually got beat up. It's the exact same thing. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's nonsensical. I love that analogy. And I think part of it too, uh, we see this run into a lot with, with Calvinism and, and that verse from Acts 2 that was brought up. If that's brought up in the sense of proving Calvinism, they're actually committing the composition fallacy because they're saying that because God has decreed and caused and willed things into into reality based upon his plan that every part of reality is willed into the the infinite detail by mm -hmm. his will and that's that's not in scripture and scripture is replete with examples of things not going according to plan and god continually working within creation to bring about his his desired will in the end despite the the freedom of man yeah. So you have to think about it. What's a more powerful God? The one that can accomplish his will through the freedom of, of creatures that have their own willpower or the one that determines everything from the beginning to end without any free will in between. Well, and, I, and to like Warren's point and Tim's point. So foreknowledge, we, Brian, how many, you and I have said this so many times on our program, but knowledge does not equal causation. Yep. Uh, so God foreknowing, I, and I use this example all the time, my daughter, okay, so funny story tonight, my daughter, while I was gone at work at church today, my, I came home and she, my, she had made, she's three, my wife helped her make this little Valentine's goodie bag of mine, it said daddy on it. Well, inside were little packets of Skittles. I opened a packet of Skittles, my daughter wanted some Skittles, she had some Skittles and she ran off to the bedroom for a little bit, I work, I was doing my workout, and then there's a little few Skittles left in that bag, and I decided I'd finish them off from my little Valentine's bag. My daughter came back and she's looking at the table. And she's like, where's my food? And I was like, oh, your, your candy. She's like, yeah, I was like, oh, sorry, honey, daddy ate it. And she looks at me and she like, I betrayed her. Like I just stabbed her in her cute little heart. And she ran to her bedroom and started sobbing to mom and telling daddy ate my candy. And I know for a fact, if I put that Skittles in front of her or some broccoli in front of her and went, all right, honey, which one do you want? I know she's going to pick the Skittles. Does that my foreknowledge knows that? Does that mean it's going to rob her of her choice? No. And it says in Acts 2.23 that it was the evil deeds of man. God knew according to his plan with the foreknowledge. What was his plan? Was it to what? Punt, determine every little thing? No, his plan was to redeem mankind and bring about a new creation. That was the plan. Now, God did not dictate that those men take a hammer and slam it into, slam nails into Jesus's hands. 
Otherwise, he determined the great. It, then it goes into the him and Satan wanted the exact same thing, right? Uh, Son of God crucified. Uh, but God knew, according to the foreknowledge, the plan, which was to redeem mankind. We take plan and we super load it with determinism. And that's just not true. And that can work on Molinism. That can work in dynamic omniscience. It can work in either one of those things. Um, it can even work in the uh, in uh, certain forms of classical theism because there are different forms of it. But like if God is pure actuality, then he's purely acting all the time, uh, which means he's also purely in the act of loving his creation, then it can still work that way. But either way, foreknowledge and plan does not equal determinism. So tangent over, carry on, gentlemen. Right on. Uh, do you guys have anything else to take a stab at that? Uh, the Acts two, or can we 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 want to move on to another one? I think it's been sufficiently dealt with. Okay, cool, fair enough. Um, I do have one from uh, one of the more prolific chatters right now from uh, Manny. I wanted to grab at least one thing that he said and try to address it because it seemed like an actual question rather than a poke. Um, what is the remnant of election according to grace? Well, I'll just uh, answer quickly from the Molinist position. It would be uh, those whom God knew who would remain faithful and persevere to the end uh, prior to creation. So again, if God possess, if an omniscient God possessed that knowledge prior to creation, um, <clears throat> then he uh, then he can predestine without determining. Um, he determines the world to come into existence with free creatures uh, coming into existence as well and can predestine without determining. So <clears throat> as uh, I don't reject election, in fact, um, in this in the study guide to my uh, to my book, um, I get into uh, how I reject, tulip but and this isn't getting uh political by any means it's think about playing poker but i offer the trump card and so instead of tulip i offer trump but that triggers people but i'm but it helps people remember it so um t-r-u-m-p the t i affirm is uh total depravity um i do believe that every uh every aspect of humanity has been infected with sin um the r would be resistible, amazing grace. So that's opposed to the irresistible grace of Tulip. Um, I, I affirm resistible, amazing grace. The U would be unconditional and unlimited love that God has for everybody. God desires a true love relationship with each and every person. Um, and uh, then the M is, uh, addresses this. It's middle knowledge of the elect. So you still get election with... Um, Molinism, but you just get it without the determinism um, and you get it without violating libertarian freedom or so it seems to me. And then finally, the P would be perseverance of free saints. So <clears throat> instead of tulip, I use Trump, um, play the Trump card. Doesn't mean you have to vote for the politician. But um, but again, I now hand it over to uh, my friend Warren, who will answer that differently. And what I love about this is that you've got determinists or, or uh, uh, libertarian free uh, freedom fighters who explain these things differently. But I like the fact that although Warren and I will disagree on how we're going to explain it, I like having, I like keeping my options open and having options on the table. And so I don't see Warren when we disagree here as my enemy. I see him as my friend. Let's, let's put as many options on the table to sink the ship of the ship of determinism. <laughs> so Warren, please launch your torpedo. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate that, that uh, charity and kindness there. And I, I feel the same way. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the mistakes that we often make is we divest God's knowledge and his power. Um, it, and so we end up forgetting that God can do things. We go, well, if God didn't do things eternally, then God can't do anything now. And so I, I think I think you end up with a problem where you end up with this idea of unless God from all eternity had effectually decreed this, then he's impotent to ensure it along the way. And um, you know, and we we see in scripture where, you know, God can raise up, you know, children of Abraham from the stones. I mean this is a God that is 
as intelligent as he is powerful and that's without measure. And, um, and so I, I don't have any issue with election. I, I don't think that election unto salvation is necessarily, uh, the way that that's generally used. Um, but, but I don't have, I don't have an issue here. I, I don't really see the, um, the, the, the objection other than just assuming perhaps certain Calvinist metaphysics into the, into the operations of God, which I reject. And I don't think if you abandon those somehow scripture is somehow, uh, undercut or, or negated. I think, I think really what he's asking for is how we would define what it means that God has a remnant of election according to grace. Um, it, because I think, I think he's assuming that what he's believing about it is true. And I, it's, I think probably one of the things that's weird about it is when you have a thought that you already accept as true, it's hard to step outside that and jump onto another person's ship and see where they're piloting, if that makes Mm, sense. Um, And so I think what he's trying to do is in some sense, like ask honestly, at least I'm my charitable reading of this is that he's asking for how we would define this, right? Like in in my context, I would say it like imagistically, the easiest way to, to, to capture something like this is let's say um, the eight that were saved on the ark were saved by God's grace, right? It was a, it was a gracious thing for God to warn them, to give them the opportunity and the instruction and the safety, the, the, the safety of, of passage through, the storm to be saved and they were a remnant that god chose to do that that this was all by god's decision that he didn't have to say something to noah but he cared and he wanted to do that and he even gave noah the ability to be a preacher of righteousness that he would invite others to repent and follow the lord but there was only this leftover and Mm. it was purely by god's decision and god's gracious decision that these people were saved even through that and that's not necessarily a soteriological context directly but it is god's God making a rescue of a leftover by choice through his own gracious decision, if that makes sense. Like, and that's something that yep, it doesn't necessarily even have to land in a, in a strictly soteriological context, like new Testament style. Yeah. Um, I mean, so Tim, you looked like you were going to say something there where you, cause I, I, I can go talk about this too, but I just want, I didn't want to cut anybody off who wanted to talk. I want to cut Will off. Is that, is that possible? You're that's muted fine. still, Tim. Sorry about that. No, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Will. I, I've said enough, so. I don't know. I, Brian, Brian, go ahead and you say speak, and I'll kind of talk about uh, Romans 11.5 here in a sec, too. All right. That, well, that's what I was going to point out is he's quoting Romans 11.5, which is if you're reading it the way he's, I think, is inferring it, which is that there is a chosen few that are elected unto salvation, then if you just read just a little bit farther in Romans 11, you have the whole concept of the Gentile inclusion to cause jealousy of Israel. So who is the remnant? The remnant, also, if you look back at Romans 9, is is Israel. It's part of the elected chosen people, elected onto the promise that are that have believed in Jesus and the rest have not believed. And if they would have believed Moses, they would have believed in Jesus. And then you have, they are then made jealous through the inclusion of the Gentiles so that they will believe it's not a fixed election. And even in, in Romans uh, 11, 5, it says at the present time. <laughs> I think you got to read the whole, even the whole verse to get the context here, much less the whole chapter. 100%. And this is why I said uh, that anachronistic view earlier, it drives me absolutely crazy. And that's because grace, again, is acting favorably towards somebody that's patron client discussions, and the remnants of election, election is covenant language that Romans nine through 11 is all about Gentile inclusion to the covenant, because he's writing to a mixed group of people between Gentiles in Rome and a Jewish group. And so he his whole thing is like, okay, what is the promise of Abraham? The promise of Abraham is that this, this, that the entire earth will be blessed. Basically, this kingdom is going to come. Well, does that mean the, the, the does that mean it's failed? No, he's included Gentiles in. He's grafted them in. Romans eleven talks about this grafting in. So, who is the remnant? The remnant are the believing ones. But the original elect, like Romans nine, the real thing is like the elect Israel 
are not the real elect. The real elect are actually those who chose to believe. That's kind of the whole point. Uh, and so it's actually like the exact opposite of what Calvinists say. And it's very easy to see this when you get to Romans 8 and you go before where he talks about the promise. It's a whole rhetoric, like it's rhetoric that it's telling the story. And so what is the, the, ele- the remnants of election are those who are left who still believe there are Jews because read Romans, uh, read Romans 11. He talks about in r- verse one of Romans 11, that he too was, uh, is of Israel. And so the remnants of the elect are those who are still believing who are Jewish. And now God can have mercy on whom he has mercy. And he means I can include the Gentiles into this covenant and save them too. That's the whole point of Romans nine through 11 is all about Gentile inclusion and covenant language. That's what election is. It's, we were elected unto the purpose of God, not we were elected unto individualistic salvation to eternal life. So again, anachronistic views that, that I, I don't understand. I don't understand how this these interpretations still exist, it, even in scholarship. What is like, look at, look, just look. You know, and uh, who, who, was that Manny? A guy named Manny? Is he the guy yeah. that asked the question? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll just say, uh, in my debate with James White, uh, I offered the following. I said, if scripture um, teaches that um, both uh, humans have libertarian freedom and that all things are predestined, then scripture teaches Molinism. Then premise two was scripture does teach that humans have libertarian free- freedom and that all things are predestined. That's debatable, but James White is going to uh, agree that all things are predestined. And so the conclusion was, Therefore, Molinism is taught by scripture. So for Manny here, he can affirm that all things are predestined um, and affirm libertarian freedom and uh, still get his election. But it's not through deterministic means, uh, if that's the case. It's through middle knowledge. And I, and I discuss how middle knowledge is the only way and Molinism is the only way to make sense of all things being predestined, including libertarian free actions. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm not going to bind the conscience of everybody on this panel to say you've got to agree with that, but uh, that gives Manny a, a way out to keep his if election is important to him. If he thinks that is in scripture, um, he just become a Molinist and you're fine. <laughs> you reject deterministic Calvinism, become a Molinist, and you still get to keep your election and your predestination of all things. And if you don't like that, then you can go to, to Warren's view. Uh, and you know, I, I look at that as like a cousin, a distant cousin to my view, you know, <laughs> um, where it's not the same as mine, but you know, we were both like, say, look, look, this Calvinistic determinism is false and it's so dangerous and it's bad for the, our, the brothers and sisters, sisters in Christ who we love that are holding it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's just ways out of, of that. And I think for good reason. So anyway, sorry, spoke too much. <laughs> but wait, there's more. There is um, more. <laughs> so um, if you guys don't have anything else to add to that, I have uh, four more questions here. Uh, we're, yeah. we're past the two hour mark. I don't know how long you guys wanted to, to continue for. Yeah, um, I, should, but, I should start wrapping up. Yeah, if you want, if you want to just blow through these last couple of questions yeah, and then we'll round it off at the end there. I think um, we, we probably have quite a lot to say about them, but um one of the first ones, just because uh, I haven't actually personally read this, and I think probably at least one of you have, um, we have uh, from Day Gyre, which is a hilarious name. Um, I am thinking, am I, oh, am I right in thinking that if we understand St. Athanasius' uh, teaching of Christ's immutability and our mutability, would we never end in total depravity? We move away and towards God. Have any of you guys read uh, St. Athanasius and know what he's talking about? Yeah, I talk about on the incarnation by Saint Athanasius. Okay, I never finished that, so. Oh, it's so good. Um, so, teaching of Christ's immutability and our immutability, we would never end in total depravity. Am I right thinking that if we understand? I'm trying to understand. Just follow the teaching of Christ's immutability and our immutability. We would never end in total depravity. We move away and towards God. I. Th- think I understand what he's saying, and I think he's correct, but it's hard to say. 
we're, I, I, I hate also, comments sometimes that are I mean, because Ath- Athanasius on on the incarnation. I mean, he's he's pretty much articulating restored icon model there, right? Um, but I I I don't recall a specific um, corollary between immutability. I'd have to go back and, and look. It's been a while. Okay, fair enough. Well, I just wanted to bring it up in fairness because I thought it was probably a good question. I mean, I love I love on the incarnation, but it, it you know I got to go back and look at it. Okay, fair enough. Cool. Um, so then, I think he's the right next- though, because I think what he's saying is that if Christ is immutable and unchanging, but we are mutable and changing. If that's true, then we would never leave total depravity because he never assumed us, so he never became mutable. I mm-hmm. think that's kind of what he's getting at. So I think he's correct, but I don't know for sure. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, so the next one that we have here is actually from my buddy Chris Padeo. Um, he says, Warren, when you say the image was broken, what does that mean exactly? Uh, man became mortal. I, I, I reject the idea that Adam was created in a mortal state. So this idea that, that man became marred with uh, suffering and, and mortality by way of consequence from his rebellion and separation from God, that that wasn't what God had intended. Um, I actually hold the view that several early church fathers held that uh, God ultimately was going to even remove the prohibition against the tree of knowledge when they matured and they were going to be able to eat from it uh, without it being sinful. And then they would have judged the fallen angels and and um, been um, uh, image bearers in, uh, like Christ uh, at that point. Um, and so the devil came in, thought he was going to throw a, a wrench in the system. And I think, I think the devil... If you, if you look from like a strategic play, like let's say like chess versus checkers, what the devil did in Genesis was really brilliant because he got it to where God would have to violate his image bearers and mar them by coming in through force and preventing them from rebelling against him, uh, which would go contrary to, I think, to God's revealed nature. Um, or he would have to allow Adam uh, this ability to rebel and mar his own image, which would grieve the heart of God. And so I think this was a, a, a pretty brilliant move on the part of the adversary uh, to to weaponize God's image bearers and kind of a, a, a means of, of destroying God's plans and lashing out uh, at the heart of God. And what he didn't count on was that God just said, okay, I'm going to quarantine you all um, under, under sin um, and again, I'm using this in terms of more like an Eastern understanding where it's like a, an infectious disease quarantine language. I'm going to uh, quarantine you all. I'm going to bring you through death and out the other side and redeem you um, and restore that that image. And we see that when Christ assumed the totality of human nature, uh, suffered, died, rose again, and then ascended. Now we are united with our humanity is united with the divine Uh, and he is seated in heavenly places right now. And we're seated with him in that shared nature, that shared ontology. But when he returns, those who've placed their faith in him will see him as he is for we'll be like him. So in that moment, we'll be transformed fully into um, full imagers uh, as God had always intended. So, you know, there's, there's issues on how you interpret the fall. There's issues on how you interpret and understand the redemptive work of Christ. But I hope that answered the, the question. No, I think that was a really great answer. I think Chris will appreciate that if I know Thank him you. at all. <laughs> oh, he's a good guy. I, I like him a lot. Yeah, Chris is a cool guy. And he'll be he'll be happy to hear you say that he's a cool guy because he looks he's a very cool guy, man. Have you seen his artwork? Oh, yeah. I, I commissioned him to paint a portrait of my wife. It's beautiful. The, the dude, hey, I, I almost became a full time artist growing up. I was in love with like Frank Frazetta. Uh, Jim Lee, like I, I got a job offer from Rob Liefeld to go work for him at Maximum Press back in the day when he was with Image, but I started developing wow. shakes and had issues with no muscle control. Way. So, like, I have major respect for Chris. Chris is extremely talented. He is top tier. I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next one uh, asked a couple of times. Our friend Jamie from chat. He's a, a regular in the the chat for uh, Faith Unaltered. So what's up, Jamie? He says. For all, is synergism true? I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like to say that I'm a synergist for two reasons. 
Um, and the first one I, I would go to is, uh, I think, um, described nicely by Ken Keithley uh, in his book called Salvation and Sovereignty. And so uh, it, this, uh, this, this first thought experiment or uh, illustration, uh, imagine that you wake up and you find yourself in the back of an ambulance. Um, and, and you're like, well, you don't even know how you got there, but you're in the back of this ambulance. People are working on you. And, uh, and you're like, well, what's going on? And they're like, you had a horrible accident. Um, and, uh, and you were about to die, but, uh, we're taking you to the hospital. Just sit back, relax. Don't do anything. If you don't do anything, we're going to get you to the hospital. We're going to get you saved. So just let us do all the work. And we got this. And then if you're like, well, wait a second, wait a second. You start ripping the IV out and, and, uh, and you know, you start punching the, the paramedics and, and they'd like pull you back down. Like, Hey, listen to us. We're trying to save you. Don't do anything. If you don't do anything, then we're going to do all the work and we're going to get you saved. And you're like, no. And you punch them in the face and you open, you know, you're going down the interstate at, you know, probably 90 miles an hour. And, and then you jump out of the back of the uh, ambulance. You're, you're going to die. Well, you know, Calvinists love to say, Hey, you can't do anything to get saved. Well, on this model, if you would have done nothing, you would have been saved, but you, that doesn't mean you don't have libertarian freedom. You can choose to do something. <laughs> you can choose to reject the love and grace that's being given to you and jump out of the back of the ambulance. But if you just let God work on you, um, uh, then, then he will do all the work to get you saved. That's number one. I, I, I hold uh, that view. Uh, number two, I'm also a synergist in this sense. Um, there is nothing you can do to get to heaven. Not even Christians. Chris, Christians are powerless to get into God's presence. God, does, God, as the creator of the universe, if you understand the Kalam, as the creator of the universe, does not exist within the universe. So he is outside the universe, right? Wherever heaven is, you can't take a spaceship there to get to heaven. No matter how good, even if you have the Millennium Falcon, you're not going to get to heaven anywhere in the universe, right? So it is somewhere other than the universe. This, this universe will at, so, at some point be uh, destroyed and there will be a new heaven and a new uh, earth, a new universe. But there, there is nothing you can do to get into God's presence, even if you're a Christian. God has to miraculously do all the work to metaphysically transport you into his presence. There is nothing you can do to get there. Um, so by God's grace and his grace alone, he chooses to metaphysically transport, as it were. Uh, he chooses, uses his power to transport you. He does all the work to transport you into his presence if you do not reject his love and grace. If you do not reject his love and grace and you allow him to work on you and to transform you, then that by God's grace, he chooses to teleport you into his presence for all eternity. Uh, so the, for those two reasons, I affirm synergism and for, and, and those two views uh, are compatible with libertarian freedom. Um, and uh, you don't have to affirm determinism or, or Calvinism there. What do you guys think of those two uh, models or preach? <laughs> I'm, I, Brian and I have recently been the people go, being like, because there's a tendency of people on, on our side of the aisle because the reform will be like monergism. Who always, so you're not a monergist, and so it's not all God doing the saving, and they kind of have a tendency to try to beat on that. So a lot of people on our side of the fence have a tendency to accept that framework yeah. that is slapped onto them and go, well, no, I have to be a monergist because I'm told I have to be a monergist. And so they go, well, no, God does all the work. I just have to believe, but he did all the work, which is true but i don't understand why i can't just go yeah i'm a synergist i 100 Syn synergio is literally used in uh in the greek like that word is used and then uh, if the early church has the whole ascetic movement you, there is continually like this idea of mankind working together with god and god working together with man they go hand in hand and i so, say yeah i'm a synergist and i think it's absolutely wait, wait, wait. biblical I, I gotta say i misspoke I'm a what I what I explained was monergism for two reasons that oh. but, but what I what so I'm sorry I really was confused I said I was a synergist for two reasons 
I'm actually saying I'm a monergist for two reasons. But once you understand how I've defined and unpacked this, the ambulatory model says, hey, uh, these the, the paramedics are doing all the work. If I let them do all the work, I will be safe. But I can resist, right? For that Trump uh, acronym, I said it's resistible, amazing grace. But if I let God do all the work, if I, if I don't choose to resist and reject him, then he will save me. Um, and then, again, it's impossible for me or any other Christian to get to heaven uh, since it's outside of the universe. All right, we It requires God to do all the work to get us into his presence. And so that is another sense of monergism where he does all the work to get me into it to get me saved, to get me into his presence right. for eternity. So in those two ways of understanding it, I can affirm monergism uh, without determinism and still affirm libertarian freedom. So I apologize for the- No, no, you're uh, good. I used to do the same thing. I I, over, the last, over the last year, I went, nah, I'll, I'll just say, I'm a sinner. It's like, yeah, I have to, I have to cooperate with God. There's synergy I don't use there. Any of these Calvinist terms anymore. That's that's my thing. Synergism, yeah. monergism, is a made up thing from the Protestant <laughs> Reformation. Just like Pelagianism, um, it's just I'm, I'm or libertarian free will or creaturely free will. These are all things that we have to adopt, and we go, okay, well, I'm going to jump into the Calvinist mindset, and I'm going to yeah. talk like them. I, I don't need to talk like them. Yeah, I just They're deny wrong. their framing all the time. Like, yeah, no, the I, framing I, is I just, completely wrong. It just, I, it's a made up debate that doesn't <laughs> exist. That doesn't so I'm like, talk about. I'm a sinner just like, what? I'm like, are you to cooperate with God? They're like, well, no, I'm like, do you cooperate with God? Do you still, even if you are regenerated before, and do you have to have faith to believe? Yeah, so you have to cooperate with God. Congratulations, you're a synergist. And I'll just, <laughs> I just, I don't care. Like I'm at that level where I'm just like, I don't care about your little framework. I don't care about your hobby horses. Now, granted, I think Tim, you and I define it very similarly. Yeah. <laughs> I just do you cooperate with God. Yes. All right. Then we can, whether you want to oh, accept it or not, there is some level of similarity here and you could use your label. I'll use my label. I don't really care about your label. Let's just talk about the facts of the thing. At, at yeah. some point it becomes semantics and it's right. a use and the monergism hammer comes out, which is why I, for the longest time said, no, I have a monergism. But now I'm just like, eh, no, you still have to. I deny your framework. Back up off me, bro. Right. Yeah, it's really, it's really like the same progressive term. We're just calling people denier. When people are like, I'm a monergist and you're a synergist, they're just saying you're a Calvinist denier. That's really what they're trying to say. And mm -hmm. even I don't, I, th I think they reject what you say, Tim, just because they'll say, well, you're not defining monergism the way I define monergism. Right, so they're right, really right. Must be synergist because unless mm -hmm. you fit this made up finite definition, yeah. just like any one of the, the screeching woke crowd will do with whatever flavor of the week new woke ism that they're going to use against you because you don't agree with them on some stupid little thing. It's, it's yeah. just a, you don't have to adopt their mindset in order yeah. to show how silly it is. That's right. my point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they do. They're like, uh, you know, when I get, give the ambulatory model uh, and I say, Hey, if, if you wake up in the back of an ambulance going to the hospital and you have no idea how you get there, uh, you can either fight the paramedics or you can lay back, relax and do nothing and let them save you. And they're like, but that's cooperation with them. And I'm like, well, it's still you doing nothing. Uh, if, if, but, but that's still cooperation. But you're saying I can't do anything. And I'm saying here, you're doing nothing. You know, and so if, if but they're like, I think no, you're just that, supposed to do work. You know, so, <laughs> well, so it's like, look, I, I will try to meet them on their ground using their terminology. And I'll, I like to say, hey, look, I can still I can still use your terminology and make it work for me. But at the end of the day, um, what's most important is a logical interpretation of scripture. And that's what uh, 100%. primarily focused on. And so all these other labels, I don't really care that much about them, but I, I, I still have fun discussing them. So if you absolutely believe in monergism versus synergism to bring it back to Tim's original statement is either the, the view that, that God gave you before the creation of time that, you believe that it's only God that has anything to do with salvation whatsoever, or you're you were given the synergistic mindset where God wants you to believe that you you have conditions for salvation. Either way, it was God's hand in that framework. Right on. Thank you guys for that. That was fantastic. I was looking for a verse where I know that uh Synergeo actually features, um, but I'm trying.
trying to listen at the same time. So I'm like half braining it and I can't find it right now. I know it's in Corinthians somewhere, but uh, we do have one more question. And I think it's actually uh, because it's the last question. I think it's probably the coolest way to end the show because it actually allows us to exercise some of the humility that we expect out of those who we disagree with to be able to consider things that they perhaps hadn't, um, you know, uh, uh, encountered before. And, you know, that that ability to change your mind. Uh, because of that willingness to 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 recognize when you haven't seen something before and now it's being clearly shown to you. Uh, he says, uh, Ben says, has anyone here ever been reading the Bible and come across a truly novel idea from scripture, something you were never taught or wasn't a regular orthodox doctrine, but is now a core belief? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, I think when I came across as somebody Hebrews, who was a Calvinist. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say when I came across Hebrews, um, I was like, surely this is novel. Like, this is changing my understanding of the incarnation. Surely this is novel. And then I started reading commentaries and studying the early church. And I was like, oh, wait, no, this is Gregory of Nazianzus. Like, smarter men than me understood it this way, uh, you know, a long time ago. And uh, that led me to really go back and rethink my, you know, Reformed Calvinist interpretation of an understanding for the incarnation and redemptive work of Christ. Um, and that is now, I think, central. I mean, I, I think that's a, a central understanding for, for that. Um, I guess I'll answer it. I'd, I'd, if I would say that I came up with a novel idea that that was never orthodox doctrine, and now is a belief of mine. No, but I definitely have come to conclusions from scripture that I found out later was right. an orthodox. Yeah, that, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah, well, I thought that was an orthodox. I was discovering it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So the or, yes, or was something I would never taught. Yeah, 100%, thousand things. Um, uh, But wasn't something that was orthodox doctrine already? No, I haven't discovered anything new yet. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Nor would I trust it if I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So has that's anyone ever of, been... Okay. Yeah, that's kind of my no, no, just I want to concur. Like, I, I definitely had moments where I was like, <gasps> Augustinian right. original sin isn't true, then, <gasps> and God never poured his wrath out on his son. <gasps> like, I had all a lot of these moments, uh, but then it was like, oh, other people have taught this for a while. Okay, I'm just <laughs> catching up with the trade, I'm just stupid. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. There's uh, I haven't had any truly novel ideas, uh, uh from reading scripture. Um, but man, I, I can think of so many times when I've read something and it just floored me. It's like, Oh wow. And then, you know, and then I study that more. I'm like, Oh, well, man, these, uh, other folks in C.S. Lewis wrote about the, you know, or, or, you know, people before him, you know, I, I think of, um, I wasn't even searching for it. In fact, uh, it was when I was still working for the church, you know, we had like 25 people on staff, um, not all pastors, but. Uh, we had a staff meeting and we were going through scripture and we were reading second Corinthians four and uh, it was really heavy on my heart at the time uh, dealing with some problems of evil and um, whether it be moral evil or uh, natural evil and sickness and, and other things uh, even, even what might be called gratuitous evil. And I read second Corinthians four seventeen in the group and and uh, it hit me so hard that I didn't hear anything else that was said during that staff meeting. All I could think about was these, Paul says, these light momentary afflictions prepare us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And it just hit me. I mean, the, and, and, and he, you know, Paul gives a whole list of his afflictions elsewhere in scripture. And then he's saying, but he's being sarcastic, these light momentary afflictions. He's talking about all the suffering that he's endured, but he also saying, Hey, this, this uh, prepares us for eternity. He's basically saying no pain, no gain. And, and in there, when you understand free will uh, combined with this, it, it's just hit me like it never had hit me before. And I was like, this is how uh, th this, these few decades we have on this rock full of pain, evil, and suffering will put us in a position that prepares us to not take the very presence of God for granted and perfection, you know, and, and it hit me that day. I'm like, wow, Adam and Eve, Satan, and a third of all the angels were created or all the angels were created in 
the presence of God in perfection where no, you know, nobody was experiencing pain, evil, or suffering. And they took it for granted and they wrecked it. Um, but, but we're blessed. Unlike Adam and Eve and, and the angels, we're blessed to be able to live for a few decades in a world with what Paul calls light momentary affliction. Because I know one thing, uh, when I wake up on the other side of death and I open my eyes for the first time on that, on that side of death and I'm looking into the eyes of Jesus, I'm not going to take that for granted. And when I realize my knees don't hurt anymore and I feel better than I've ever felt in my life and, and I see everybody around, there's no pain, no suffering, no animal suffering, no, nobody is suffering and everybody is loving each other and loving God. I, for one, will not take that for granted. Why? Because I have experienced pain, evil, and suffering, and I see others experiencing it, and I hate it. And man, when that when I read that passage in Scripture, it floored me, and that was years ago, and I still think about it and preach it all the time. Now, is that a novel, something novel? No, <laughs> many people have talked about it. But man, when that first hit me, um, changed my life. So answers the problem of evil right there in scripture. Right on. You got anything, Warren? No, it's just, I, I want to, you know, rehash and, and like the way I read this is, has anyone ever been reading the Bible and come across a truly novel idea from scripture, meaning something you were never taught or right. wasn't a regular belief? Yeah. Yes. Um, now, novel like, to yeah, me, novel to me. Like, okay. And that's, that's go. what I was saying when I was discussing Hebrews and the incarnation, like, in my Christology, it had nothing to do with soteriology other than getting him to the cross. And I didn't understand the, the redemptive aspect of him taking on human nature. And so as I started to read Hebrews 2, and then I went over to 1 John 4, that clicked. And I thought, am I, am I really understanding this correctly? Like, this, this could be profound. And that began me uh, studying all the different atonement theories and redemptive models and uh, that required, I mean, easily a year, if not two years of intense study. Um, and it kind of opened the door. You know, there's these little, like, I love I love what you're talking about with stories. And I think of C.S. Lewis, you know, like, there was this little um, wardrobe sitting in the corner that I had overlooked every time I went into the room. And yet one day I open it up and it's a whole other world of, of, knowledge and understanding and relationship. And that's what Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 was for me. It was like, it was the wardrobe that took me into Narnia and it just opened up uh, the work of Christ in a whole new way. And it wasn't that, that, you know, I'm inventing things as I go, or I'm, you know, running off trying to cobble new doctrines together. But as I was carefully, you know, studying the the early church and what they believed, I found this was common. This is this was the view, and uh, and then that challenged so many other little things, and it led to other little wardrobes opening up, you know. And um, but it was it was not an orthodox Calvinist belief that I held, but I discovered that it was a Christian orthodox view, um, and that is now a, a very much a core belief, and mm -hmm. I've devoted a lot of time studying it and then also teaching on it. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, for, for me personally, I would say that the, the thing that became novel to me because I grew up in, I've been going to church since I was two weeks old. Um, the, the thing that, that struck me as novel, especially as an adult was that revelation of the importance and continuity of the image of God as the, as one mm -hmm. of those main through lines of scripture. Um, and how that applies to, um, when, when they try to ta uh, trap Jesus with the question about taxes and he mentions the image on the coin and then what you give to Caesar and what you give to God and the fact that the image was the thing that he recognized in that situation mm. and pointed to and said, which one is which, which one, what's on the mammon and what's on you. You give the mammon to where it comes from and you give you to where it comes from. And that was so deeply powerful to me and the continuity with that 
to Paul's talk about all have fallen short of the glory, which would be to properly image or reflect God's nature and character to the creation that he gave us dominion over, and that our failure to be proper images is actually what it means to be sinful in in that sense. And so repentance is to return to what God's intent was for me as an imager in his world, in his story, that my place is my place. And if I'm not actively participating in it, no matter if I'm doing something overtly evil or not, it is sinful not to participate in the way that God intended. Uh, and then also um, the way that this informs, let's say, how I can how I can genuinely value myself. Like I said, as somebody who overcame thoughts of suicidality and things like that, I, I genuinely have a reason to be here. Life is something worth doing. And it's because I have identity and I have value and I have purpose in him and not in my own conceptions of who I think I'm supposed to be or in my skin tone or my, my genitalia or my, my sexual preferences or any other such arbitrary nonsense. The, the, this, is, this is where people are going right now that I think this is something that could really wake up the modern world is, a, is, is this... Uh, revelation that you like your your identity is first and foremost being that that imager of god like that's what you were intended to be that's your intended state uh that's your ultimate state if you're in christ is to properly image god we shall see him and we shall be like him whatever that means um and 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 it's just like to me i get that fire in my bones when i think about that part of it right and the way that this kind of draws everything together and then recognizing Christ was not only uh, a God, God and man, he was the perfected image. He was the, let's say, the icon God made of, of, of himself, the perfected image that was meant to represent him in the earth in its exactitude. And he did that perfectly. And so his life for me, I was always obsessed with his death for me. His life for me is that much more important now, you know? And so for Amen. me, that was the novel idea that I encountered that makes everything that I'm doing like way more livable, way, way, like I love my children more. You know what I mean? Like I, it's not just that I love, like and love myself more. That's one thing. I know a lot of Calvinists don't like the idea of self-love or whatever, but like not sure any of them that say that have genuinely encountered the kind of desperation that would bring you to suicidality. But if you don't love yourself, there's some serious problems. Like it's one thing to become self-obsessed. It's another thing to be self-loathing. Right. And so I don't think that as, as, as C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And I think that was part of that revelation for me was, was having a proper context for where I actually am supposed to be important for me and why that makes self sacrifice what it is. You know what I mean? And so I think that was for me, that was the novel idea that kind of just, you know, and blew yeah. me apart and continues to do so like every day. Right. And I, I have, I have my own segment on faith unaltered. If you guys are interested in it called the cosmic corner in which that's the main emphasis of what I'm doing there is trying to re-enchant the world for people who have fallen asleep to the reality of their identity in, in God, like as an imager of God, as your intended state, as you're like, if you aren't do, doing what you're intended to do, you will frustrate every bit of potential and joy and love worth having. Right. And, and if that's the case, then the best reconciliation for that is what the scripture calls confession, which is homo legeo, to speak the same as God, to agree with God about what's going on in the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that all comes back to the fact that the scripture doesn't start in Genesis three. It starts in Genesis one. And then we have the introduction of the importance of mankind as the pinnacle and, and all that stuff. And it's just that. That for me nests me in a context where I can live as though that's all true and Christianity informs the rest of the universe for me. And so that was that was my aha yeah. moment. But um, if you guys want to, I I, I want to go uh, around one more time and let you guys, you know, plug your content and stuff. And if you have any closing thoughts or whatever, but that's pretty much all the questions that I had saved off to the side. So um, if you guys want to, you know, starting with Tim, if you want to plug your channel and give a, give yeah. a round um, of yeah, Free Thinking Ministries on YouTube and Free Think Inc. That's Free Think I N C uh, dot org um, for other content. Oh, and, and this book just came out. It's uh, called Faith Examined New Arguments for Persistent Questions, and it's essays in honor of Frank Turek. And I had the chance to contribute a, uh, a chapter in there and talk about free will and stuff in there. So check it out. Cool. Right on. Go ahead, Warren. 
Oh, uh, yeah. So you can go to uh, Idol Killer over on uh, YouTube and check out what we do there. We have serious teaching content, which if that's what you're into, the algorithm will feed you. If you're into satire and parody, we've got a lot of funny, biting uh, videos over there. And if that's what you're into, that's what the algorithm will feed you. Uh, but we do both. And um, I enjoy mixing it up because I get bored and I like to laugh. And I think that also when you're studying <laughs> in-depth, serious content where sometimes people's feelings can get mixed in with the criticism of the doctrine, I think it's healthy to laugh and kind of let the air out and kind of decompress. And so some of that laughter is directed at the idea uh, that is in, in view and some of it's directed even at myself. Um, but, uh, I try to have a good blend over there. Um, and, uh, well, I'm very, Warren, involved I just, in I, just got to interrupt you because you're, you teach through satire. Also, some of your videos that are all about satire just have so many, uh, are just powerful nuggets of truth <laughs> in there as well. And so I've used some of your, uh, videos and shared those with others that are funny but because they also teach truth, that's what the Babylon Bee does yeah. as well. And you do such a great job. By the way, I'm, I've told you this before, but I'm really jealous of the name of your your site, Idol Killer. It is, uh, <laughs> I'm so jealous of your name. I wish, like, why didn't I come up with that first? But good job, <laughs> that's, that's really Thank good. Thank you. No, I, I, that's very kind of you. I, I really appreciate it. I, yeah, I, I, try to use, I try to use humor constructively. Um, I may, I may try and dismantle an idea, but one of the things that I'm becoming more and more, uh, cognizant of is to end it on a constructive note. I'm trying to get better at, at not just coming in and saying this idea is wrong and here's why, but I'm also trying to make sure that I'm ending the content, rebuilding and pointing people back to Christ, back to scripture. Nice. And, uh, as a YouTuber, you know, you kind of learn this as you go. And, uh, and I'm very much a work in progress when it comes to how I form my, my content. But I'm becoming more and more dialed in on not just offering a criticism, but also trying to then be edifying and build people back up. And uh, awesome. but it, it's a fun channel. I hope everybody checks it out and enjoys it. And uh, half my subscribers uh, can't stand me and the other half love me. And, <laughs> and I'm OK with that. You know, like if you go and you, you read the you read the comments and man, there's some brutal comments over there. And I welcome, I welcome you all. Uh, I was, I was once uh, opposed to these ideas myself. So just yeah. come in and tell me why I'm wrong, and maybe along the way we'll convince one one another. You know, mm -hmm. fair enough. And then, by the way, Warren, I want to thank you too because I, the first time I had ever interacted with your ideas outside of a comment section and having like a short one or two comment exchange with you personally was the debate that you did with. Um, Matt Slick. Oh Lord. Um, that, that was, that was one of the coolest ways I have ever seen someone model the ability to stay level and maintain composure and a steady countenance. Mm -hmm. I want to give you some props for that, bro. Cause I would not have been there. I consider myself a pretty calm and collected person, especially among controversy, but that was genuinely one of those things that I, I felt like I needed to do better after that. And so oh, I want to thank, thank you. you for being a good model for yeah. some of these things, even if people are upset I, with you right now for external reasons. I just want to give you a reason to be happy about it. I appreciate the encouragement. Your, your really action has been an encouragement to me personally. So I just want to throw that out there. Thank you. I, I appreciate that encouragement. I'm, I'm trying to be better about it. I, I, you know, we all have our struggles, but I'm trying. And fair enough. Uh, and then the uh, the uh, church split guys, whichever one of you want to go first, uh, go ahead. I would, I'll say it first, and then Will, you can have the last word. How's that? <laughs> and I was like, what you do love do? The <laughs> you both are um, simultaneously. That's great. Yeah, unfortunately, we think alike too often. So some people ask us if there's any things we disagree on, which is very few. Um, but the church Apparently, split isn't ironically know, named. Other, that's a good disagreement on when when did you. Miss that's true. We did have that pre-stream. Um, yeah, so the church split is is kind of like a late night theology show. Like if you want like a late night show talking theology, that's us. Will and I talk to each other like we talk when we're hanging out, having a beer, enjoying bro time. Um, we don't take ourselves that, that seriously, but we take theology very seriously. And 
we do promote church unity. That is our goal, but we also try to promote mental toughness of the believer so that when you encounter beliefs that you don't believe yet or haven't believed or don't understand that you don't immediately go to screeching and tears and name calling, but you can have a, a, a great discussion. And like Josh was talking about, Warren, have a level headed discussion about it instead of having your brain go directly to the mentality that, uh, that you, you think you're being violently attacked personally or physically. It's just an idea. Don't take ideas personally. And uh, I think in the theology realm, we do way too much of that. And I think Bill Gates maybe was a great example of that. Thanks, Warren. Um, but I, we just try you to mean, talk you theology. Mean, thanks, Jordan. You mean thanks, Jordan. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> like yeah. studios woo <laughs> yeah exactly but uh yeah the theology world especially online is very contentious and, and very argumentative and i think we can we can actually find some unity and we can find some truth in scripture if we just go back to it and i think we need to get past the idea of it's clearly in the bible it's clear and there's so often it's not clear and i think a lot of us avoid texts that we don't understand or don't fit our systematic and uh like um Michael Heiser says, those are the verses that you need to put the most attention to. So we try to do that a lot in the church split. And like we said, we don't take ourselves ser too seriously and we even rebut ourselves sometimes. So we like to have some fun. Yeah. Uh, to what Brian said, we're very big on the idea of mental toughness because I should be able to listen to people criticize my ideas, do uh, reductio argumentation, uh, even use hyperbolic or pejorative language uh, against my ideas and not absolutely get triggered about it. Take it deeply personally. And and that's a huge issue because one of the biggest issues in church unity, because the church split is the church split, by the way, kind of like Captain Jack Sparrow. If you, uh, the, the church split, it's an event, okay? I need People are like, oh, the church split. I'm like, no, it's the church split. Anyway, it's a pet peeve. It doesn't roll. It doesn't sound as good when you just say church split. So anyway. Yeah, cool, just, I repent. Yeah, jeez, Josh. Right when you said church split at the beginning of this, I almost interrupted you. I was like, nope, no, let him do his intro. Um, but the... But the church split really is it's like we even though it's called that we want unity, but in order to have unity, you can't ignore difficult issues. You actually have to address them and talk about them and be OK with talking about them. We have uh, Tim Stratton and Warren McGrew in the same conversation who have very different views on how God interacts with the free will of mankind and how his knowledge works in reality. And guess what? They're still friends. They're still being friendly. They're not being nasty toward one another. And that is one of the things that's like, that's what happens when you develop some amount of mental toughness. Now, it doesn't mean that Brian and I don't bring a hammer because we will bring a hammer and we're not afraid to bust it out. But usually it's when the situation I we at least think calls for it. But we also allow for you to disagree and hit your hammer back to us without us losing our absolute minds and blocking you from our platform. Because Brian and I, uh, usually when we see someone blocking people left and right, we're just like, ooh, we got a weakling over here who can't handle it so uh anyway that said uh we do discuss unity issues we discuss theology issues it is a late night theology show that is meant to like brian said it is as if we're sharing a beer once in a while we'll hear people be like oh it's just a lot of banter i'm like yes yeah, two guys discussing theology late at night usually and discussing the various issues at hand and one of the things that brian and i realized in that was lacking in our world uh in the theology world was that fun, jabbing, uh, lighthearted, uh, and sometimes serious, but usually lighthearted like discussions that you see in a late night show that you don't really run into that because most Christians want to be above bar and they usually uh, have like a very kind of like holier than thou kind of, or maybe not holier than thou or, but at least a very polished approach. Brian and I wanted to kind of shed that and show that theology can be fun. Theology is something you can do with your friends and mm -hmm. It's something that you should welcome and that Brian and I, our theology has grown together. We've disagreed with each other. God forbid when that ever happens, by the way, when Brian and I do disagree, it is like days on end of us just beating each other's faces. in. I mean, one of these days, Brian, as soon as we realize we disagree somewhere, we need to stop texting and talking and just do a live oh, right, stream. So <laughs> I just so that everyone can see what it's like. And they're like, oh, my gosh, these guys are nasty to each other. Like, because we are brutal with each other when we disagree. And it's OK to be brutal because sometimes you need that. Like, I need to be punched in the teeth before I realize the end result of my belief system. So anyway, all that to say, check out the church split if that sounds interesting to you. Right on. And again, I, I really appreciate all of you guys and 
your your tone, your approach. Uh, Tim, I really appreciate the way that you organize all of your thoughts. I wish I was such a good note taker. Um, I have like 10 trains going on in my head constantly and I have to pick which one of them I'm going to flip the switch on. Uh, and so I wish I could organize like that. That is so cool. Um, but I, I, again, I appreciate you guys coming on here. I appreciate the conversation. Uh, everybody in the chat, this has been super lively. It's impossible to keep up with by myself. Uh, so if anybody asks questions, we didn't get to them. I'm really sorry, but this is just, it's hard to, it's hard to be in both places at once. Um, but we, we did our best. Um, I with I wish I had a stethoscope right now to check the vitals, but I'm pretty sure Calvinism's dead. Um, now that we've now that we've covered all the bases that I think were necessary in these two episodes, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a whole lot of clip mining going on. So uh, expect to see a couple of shorts that are going to be of uh, great utility, especially to me. I think, uh, and uh, just another reminder uh, to everybody: don't be so. Quick to make a point that you make an enemy instead. I think that's the the come away here. That's my takeaway. And uh, the unanimous head nod just now makes me feel pretty comfortable with that one. So um, with that being said, I do wish Tyler was still here because I love that brother and all this talk about overcoming disagreement with love and graciousness. Clarity is king, but clarity with charity is our motto here at Faith Unaltered. And I'm super pleased to know that I've been friends with Tyler for upwards of almost seven years now, and we did not start by agreeing. That's for sure. And so it, it's really possible to have the long game going on and not every conversation conversation you have to have has got to be a mic drop or a, a mind changing conversation. Sometimes you should just shut up and listen. Sometimes you should learn to ask questions and act in humility to assume the person you're talking to might know something you don't. Right. And then just approach the situation with the ability to ask clarity questions rather than trying to make arguments every time you talk. And so that's going to be something that brings about a lot more consistency and virtue in your engagement, because if you allow yourself the space to be able to say, I understand before saying I disagree, you'll get a lot further with one another. And I think that's something that is irreplaceable with rhetoric. You're not going to get an argument that overcomes genuine concern and regard for one another enough to take each other seriously. So mm -hmm. that's my that's my uh, takeaway and my soapbox for this whole thing. Uh, with that being said, Faith Unaltered is going to have another stream this Friday. Um, David is going to be having Ben Watkins on. We're doing series uh, through uh, David's interest. He's writing a, a, a paper on uh, the problem of evil. And so we have recurring episodes on problem of evil. Um, we had Philip Carey on, we've had a couple of different people on uh, Travis Worth and people like that. And this week we're going to have Ben Watkins next Friday. We're going to have uh, another episode of cosmic corner. We recently discussed spiritual vampirism and the next episode, we're going to be talking about the narrative themes and patterns of zombie stories. And uh, just to give you guys a little bit of flavor, the reason why this is important to me at all is because in story, you see these patterns emerge what do vampires eat blood what do zombies eat the body what do christians eat both so that's why you want to know so come and check that out if that sounds even vaguely interesting to you i'm a huge nerd we think in real time live none of this stuff is organized in cosmic corner um it was it's it was birthed out of a conversation and it's a conversation ongoing and so i'm trying to uh model what i what i talk about in being careful with our thought but being bold enough to think because thinking is risky uh it's costly and it's uh it's one of those things that's worth doing if you do it properly and uh i i invite other people to do the same but if that sounds interesting to you try to catch cosmic quarter next friday not this friday next friday at seven eastern um and every tuesday we have our three crowns uh uh, uh stream with uh dane von ace uh, talking about Trinitarian apologetics, uh, if that interests you. Tuesday night at 7 Eastern is our uh, Trinitarian apologetics. And that's what we've got going on for Faith Unaltered. If you like what you hear tonight, uh, go ahead and give a like on the video. Try to subscribe to the channel and hit the, uh, the bell button. Hit the all notifications so you'll always know when we're going to go live. Uh, we go live every Friday at 7 Eastern, every Tuesday at 7, and sometimes on Saturdays or Mondays with special shows. Uh, and um, if, if that's if this channel has been a blessing to you, if you'd like to be a blessing to us, we have uh, links for for Patreon and or not uh, sorry, PayPal and uh, that kind of thing on our, our homepage on YouTube. But more particularly, if you don't have money to help us out with, we're our ministry because that's how we, we're listener supported. But if you can't do that, 
pray for us, man. We could always really use it because if you're on God's radar, you're on Satan's radar and we need the help. Um, so with that, this has been a fantastic conversation. Everybody in the chat seems to be really blessed by this. And with that, I'll say in the spirit of my brother, Tyler, who isn't here, good night. God bless and stay like Christ.